Hello and a warm welcome from the studio here in Erlangen and I gladly welcome you to our third tutorial in our series around bus bar protection. Today we will focus on the application of a centralized CProtect 7SS85 and the CT dimensioning. And it's not me giving the webinar, it's me, Michaela Mönikes, giving you an overview on the webinar, but it's my two experts here in the studio that will present the important information for you. So I'm really happy that my dear colleague Nina Hühn is here with me in the studio and my dear colleague Rainer Gobler. Rainer and Nina, I think by now you might already know, are definitely protection experts, really experienced engineer around um, bus bar protection. Rainer is even a member of some SIGRE um, working groups and around IEC definitions. And the best thing about those two is they will share their knowledge with you out there. And so let's start with a short glimpse into today's agenda. What can you expect from us today? We will start first with a short recap of the CProtec 5 configurator, Nina will give that overview. Then Rainer will continue to bring um, you knowledge on how to configure a centralized bus bar protection with Dixie 5. Nina will then continue your journey and let you experience how to test the centralized CProtec 7 SS85 bus bar configuration with a CProtec Digital Twin. And last but not least, we already mentioned that in the beginning, though you will get to know more about the CT dimensioning. And so uh, you see a lot of breaks in between. We want to have this a vivid session. So before each break, we will do a short question and answers round. Not only the one at the end of the session, but we will take some minutes for first question and answers after each of the three blocks. And to make you part of this conversation, because it's not me that will have the questions, you are out there, are the almost experts here in the studio, are the experts around the CPROTEC um, configurations. So please put your questions into the questions and answers field. And I will be your voice at each question and answer round and ask your question directly to the expert. And I think, Nina, by now it's time to start, right? So have fun with Nina presenting the re recap of the CProtec 5 configurator. Nina, the stage is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Michaela. And yeah, welcome also from my side, of course. Yeah, um, at the beginning of this of this tutorial, I want to give a short recap of the Cibotec online configurator. And today we are talking about a centralized bus bar protection. And um, for this, we prepared a small example configuration for the centralized approach. And this can be seen here on the slide. We have a double bus bar with four feeders and one coupler. Uh, two feeders on the left side of the coupler, two feeder on the right side of the coupler, and um, the coupler has two CTs. Okay, so let's check what are the bullet points for the configurator. We have four feeders um, and one coupler, so five base on total, and uh, six current transformers um, in this overall configuration. We have a double bus bar and in this case, for this, we need uh, two bus zones. The disconnector image is necessary because um, independent of the disconnector position, a CT can be assigned to the different bus bars. And whenever this is uh, valid, you need a disconnector image. So the significant feature I want to choose later is the two zones with four bays and including the disconnector image. The functions we want to configure today is the 50BF, the breaker failure protection, 50EF, the end fall protection, and the bus coupler differential protection. And yeah, let's talk about binary inputs. 
Here I want to configure eight per feeder bay. The eight bays are for um, two for each disconnector, means four in, um, with these two disconnectors, three for the circuit breaker, where um, two of them are for the circuit breaker position and one for the circuit breaker close command. And the number eight of the binary inputs that we need is um, the start signals for the circuit breaker failure protection. For the coupler bay, we only need seven binary inputs because there we don't want to configure uh, external uh, additional um, circuit breaker failure protection. Okay. So, so much about this example. Let's jump right in into the online configurator. And yeah, this is the online configurator surface here. I will switch to full screen and zoom in a little bit. I hope it is now good to read and see for you. Uh, we start by selecting here the device. And this is Cipotec 5 device. Okay, so here's the overview about the device types that can be selected. We are talking about bus bar protection, so this is what I choose here. And I also jump over this quick description. I think we are above this point <laughs> already, no more. Okay, now this is the point where you choose the significant feature. So the first uh, six significant features are the ones for the centralized. Uh, bus bar protection and for the IEC 61850 compliance solution and the other five options here are for the 7SS85CU distributed bus bar protection but um, today the first six ones are the interesting ones and as I told earlier uh, I want to choose the option here two zones for base and including the disconnector image. So confirm the step with next. And here you have the option to choose your standard variant, uh, which one you want to start with. And I chose in preparation that I want to start with the standard variant V2. And confirm the step again. And here on the top of this uh, site, you always see the overview of the device um, like you already selected it. So you um, see the base module, the expansion model you choose and how much binary inputs, binary outputs and current transformers are available. And as we see here, current transformers are 16 or here below it's four times these four. And um, as we saw in the example earlier, we need a setup with um, six current transformers, so this is not sufficient. And this is where I want to start right now. So I go to add and remove modules to add an additional expansion module. And here we can see um, all is already one IO203 selected. And here I increase this number from one to two. And then we can check in the overview. Now we have six times four um, current inputs, and this is sufficient for our setup. Okay, but yeah, let's scroll to the top again. Now we see here we only have 15 binary inputs and 15 binary outputs at the moment. And as I mentioned earlier, we want eight per feeder bay and seven for the coupler bay. This is, uh, means we need 39 binary inputs in total. So 15 is not yet sufficient. That means we need another expansion modules for um, more to get more binary inputs. And for this, I choose check the um, IO 231 here. Okay, and scroll down up to the top again and now we see we have these 39 binary inputs which is exactly what we need so we can go with this setup as it is shown here okay 
I go to this next step to the plugin and communication models. Of course, for a centralized uh, bus bar protection, in difference to the distributed one, we need no, um, there are no um, communication modules mandatory, but uh, typically we need a module for um, substation communication. And for this reason, I add the Ethernet BB module here. Okay, so confirm the step. Um, maybe now it is a little bit too much zoomed in. I get a little bit smaller now. Okay. So here, once again, the overview about what we already selected. Um, as we can see also here, it is still a small display, and this is what I want to change now. Because for bus bar protection, it makes always sense to go with a big display and or the large display here, because as soon as you want to display some of the single line elements, for example, it is nicer to have more space on the display. I choose this option here. And then we still have to talk about the function points. So I open the function points calculator here. Of course, the main um, protection functions like um, the bus bar differential protection for, of course, um, or the inherent circuit breaker failure protection are already included. But we want some more functionality. And as first, I start with the function points for the necessary base. Because um, I hope you remember our example has um, five base, but we in our significant feature, we are, have only four base included. Um, this can also be seen here. So there's this. Um, check with that four base are already included, but we need uh, five here, so I increase this number. Okay, then right above this bay option, there's the bus coupler differential protection. This is a function we also would like to configure or to demonstrate here in this tutorial. So I choose this another 50 function points for the bus coupler differential, and then we need the end fall protection and the circuit breaker failure protection. So here's the end fall protection. These five points we need for all the five base. So I increase this number here to five. And the circuit breaker failure protection, here I go with the three pole option. And this uh, is a functionality we want to configure only in the feeder base and not in the coupler bay. Yeah, because typically the external faults happen in the feeder bay and not in the coupler bay. So this is a number I only have to increase to four. Okay, and let me check my notes if I missed something. Oh, no, it looks good. So um, these 185 um, points are all we need. So I apply this. and scroll to the top. Here you can see the short code and the long code of the device um, we created. And of course you can save this option as PDF. And yeah, with this short code now, Rainer is good to start with his configuration. So Rainer, welcome on stage. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nina. Short switch of laptops. So, hello once again, also from my side. As Michaela has already told, for today's tutorial, we want to show, we want to demonstrate the example from the beginning. Nina now has configured a small centralized bus bar protection. I will configure exactly the substation Nina has shown. And uh, with this configuration, I will do now with Dixie 5. Nina will afterwards demonstrate uh, some faults and tests uh, in the digital twin. So we really want to demonstrate here really an example step by step from the beginning. Okay. I have already owned Dixie 5. And first step, we really want to start really from the beginning, I will create a completely new project. Project new, and I would say, yes, 
uh, project 2023 and the date of the day. That's fine as the name of our project. Needs every time a little bit. And Nina is behind me to be <laughs> careful uh, that uh, the project, the device I will create, will exactly fit uh, to the setup of her demonstration in the digital twin. So configuring uh, buffer protection, protection, especially a centralized buffer protection, has every time three major steps. In the first step, I will create the single line diagram, exactly the single line diagram from the substation you want uh, to protect. In the second step, I will create the device and all the necessary elements in the device. And in the third step, I will assign the elements from the single line diagram to the elements of the device. And these are mainly the same parts independently, whether you will configure a centralized passport protection or a distributed passport protection. Maybe there are some difference to make it a little bit more efficient between the centralized and the distributed, but they are uh, quite uh, low. In the first step, I will start to create the single line. So I open the single line configuration. I adapt in the first step the zooming, which I would say 80% should be fine. I will just delete. I go to the libraries. I open the global Dixie 5 library. I open the types and I will start with the single line elements. And here in the single line elements, we have protection templates. And I open the protection templates and we will start, as Nina has said, she wants to she wants to show us a double bus bar configuration. I will start with a double bus bar and line feeder template. You could see it here. So far, fine. So it's but uh, please change the assignment of the disconnectors to the bus bar. So the left one to the lower bus bar. Uh, a special feature this from Nina. <laughs> how I did my configuration. I did it in this way in 10 years, but Nina, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So but thanks for the hint. I would already have forgotten this once again. So that's fine. Already extend a little bit the bus on. So we need for base, bay two, and a coupler bay in the middle, when I remember correctly. Yes. And uh, bus coupler, and here we have a coupler bay. As I say at the moment, we have already the bus zones, so we will till oh, <laughs> this was I clicked wrongly. Second try. Why is it here? And I guess you once again want to connect the right side to the upper bus exactly, zone. Yes. So it has to be consistent. Oops. And we want to have a coupler uh, in the so-called overlapping arrangement to have a very uh, fast uh, clearance time. And okay, but we will have, all have also the um, bus coupler differential protection. So we will demonstrate both. Uh, but here the CTs are arranged not very well uh, for bus bar protection. And so I have moved one of the CTs to the other side of the uh, circuit breaker. And so in the first step, I have to delete the connections. I 
I pick it up, we'll raise it here, connect it to the other side. Uh, that's every time a little bit tricky. So the coupler looks fine, but we need to feed us more. Okay, copy this feeder, paste it. Um, if we really want to do the same configuration I did, uh, you have to change on this feeder three and four, the CT to the line side. And for the first two base, it's Okay, give me a moment. And... Let me first finish yes. the two <laughs> <Sure>. elements. <laughs> So, bay five. Oh, 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 oh. This one. And I remember I will come to your position uh, of the cedar once again. I guess we should call this a coupler. Mm -hmm. so, a coupler. And uh, which feed is uh, right? Uh, three and four line side. Ah, three and four. Okay. Oh. Let's shift a little bit. Uh, they are line side, Nina. No, um, both cities are line oh, yeah. side. Do you want to change <laughs> the other ones to bus bus side? Um, I think I did it, yes, but I just... Okay, shall I, uh, I know, change it to the like side? Okay, <laughs> so now I was a little bit confused, sorry, yeah. <laughs> because now I mentioned it's already uh, line side. Both of the current transformers are line side uh, for bus bar protection. Of course, we will need, uh, especially in the feeder, only one CT, but I will demonstrate it's not, uh, it's not necessary to remove it from the overall CT. Uh, we simply will assign only one CT to the uh, bus bar protection elements. So, and so it's uh, absolutely fine. Um, I get the next thing. Now we want to change the color of the bus zones, here are the bus zones, uh, for the coloring in the online monitoring of the, in the single line, either in the web browser or in Dixie 5. Uh, to do this, I will open once again here the properties. I will select the bus bar one. And we see here the online, online color. And uh, the upper side was red. red. Was red. red. So the upper bus zone will be the online color red. And the will, other one green. So like the other one, it's green. And here, oops, a little bit deeper. Uh, now it's green. Uh, what else should be changed? Uh, the um, primary rated current, uh, the primary rated current of the feeders. Yeah, could see is uh, the default value is one thousand amps. Uh, it's fine for all feeder base, but the coupler base, uh, I think that's. Uh, should be quite near to reality. So typically in couplers between bus zones, the uh, current could be much higher. Uh, so typically there are a higher rated uh, CT in the coupler. And we have decided here uh, for 2000 amps. So I will select CT, or so CT2 in the coupler. And I will change the rated primary current to 2000 amps. And I will select the second CD. And it's also 2000 amps. Safe. 
Okay, Nina. I am ready. Ready with a single line diagram, mm -hmm. or if I forgot something. Okay. Looks good. So first step, uh, I have finished now the single line diagram of the substation to be pro protected by our Basma protection device. Second step will to create the device and all necessary elements in the device. Uh, before you need the device drivers, the Tixit device drivers, the DTDs. I will just show you uh, which DTDs I have imported. Uh, we are selecting tools and go to manage device drivers. And so you see that I have imported device drivers of the communication protocols. Uh, more necessary in the next tutorial when we are talking about the distributed passport protection, but also typically necessary in a centralized passport protection because nowadays really every device, especially a passport protection device, has a connection to a substation communication. So here we, I have several merging units we will need uh, in our last tutorial. And for passport protection, we have the 7SS85. Uh, we have the from version 8.84 until version 9.40. 9.40 is the newest one. And I will create uh, for our demonstration, of course, the newest firmware version, the 9.40. And what again is very important to see really is that we have one device which which is able to make a centralized bus bar protection, a distributed bus bar protection, and it's only one firmware, it's one code, it's one device where you can figure really all different types of bus bar protection. Okay, that should be. Let us create an centralized bus bar protection with a product code Nina have created. At device. That's a P1E11 8070. Let's verify. There are for Basper protection, there are not so much application templates because simply the rarity is so large, it makes no sense. So we have really only a basic template where we have one bus on. We will select them. And for the communication uh, protocols uh, using the firmware version 9.40, there are also no options. So you have, must use the 9.40. And I say, OK. And now, typically, we have to overbridge some time when <laughs> Dixie 5 is uh, creating the device. So importing CFC, some CFC functions. OK, the device is ready. Let's have a look uh, to the device view. I select the device, the 7SS85, and we can check whether the product code really <laughs> created the device uh, Nina has configured. It Next has a large, a large display, only, only 16 LEDs, and uh, two ex three extension modules, and Two IO two hundred and three and one IO two hundred thirty one. So that's fine. Okay, before uh, we will create the elements, uh, we will in the first step create the measurement points. We go to the we are open the device. We are on the device. We go to measurement points routing. And since I think since, since two years, we have a very nice feature that it's possible to create in one step, not only one additional measurement point, we can already create in our, in our example up to six measurement points and they will be automatically routed to the available uh, CTs in the 7SS85. So we have for PASPA protection only three phase uh, measurement points are allowed and the count for feeders and uh, two CDs in the coupler we need six measuring points. 
And then it makes sense to rename them, that it is to keep a better overview about the measuring points and the connections between the base and the measuring points. Especially when you will see later in the, when we make the assignment between mm -hmm. the elements of the device and the single line element, uh, and it's very helpful uh, to be sure which measurement point should be assigned later to which bay. And therefore, as Nina proposed, we will give the naming of the measurement point according to the bay we will assign some later. That's bay zero one. Bay zero two. <clears throat> Oops. Bay zero three. I see long problems. Do you have problems with my voice? Yes, okay. Sorry. Excuse me. We have a little bit problems with my sound, as it seems. Okay. <laughs> okay. I will continue. A four in the two measurement points for the coupler. Sets couple the first one for the coupler and the second one for the coupler. Two. Okay. And now we will create the additional elements in the device. And therefore, we, there are different ways how to do this. You can uh, uh, drag and drop them from the library to the settings or into the routing matrix. Uh, as for the buster protection, we have to work anyway a lot with the single line editor. I will do the same by drag and drop them to the element to the uh, to, to the device in the single line editor. So I will close. Normally we should see here this device. The 7S85. And the first step you see we have at the moment only one bus on, but we have a double bus bar. So we need an additional bus on to assign some later. So we are here in the global Dixie 5 library. Types bus bar protection, 7SS85 bus bar protection, function group bus bar. Passbar protection, it's a little <laughs> bit exhausting, I know. Mm, good <laughs> hidden. Sets according to the structure uh, in the project files and in Dixie 5. And here we have the bus on. And we will drag and drop them to the bus bar protection. And now we have two bus ons. And we need a bay. So we will drag and drop a bay for the bay one. So let's finish the uh, first bay first. Uh, let's start with the, according to routing, we started with the circuit breaker. So let's create also the circuit breaker mm -hmm. first. We have the same <clears throat> order. Uh, bay. Okay, I have to open the bay and the function group. Sorry, a little bit sweeple. I guess you have chosen a circuit breaker three ball. Yes, yes. That's enough. So we have a circuit breaker, and should we create? Oh, let's or let's uh, <laughs> already create the uh, additional function in the mm -hmm. circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. Makes it a little bit more quick here. Uh, we need uh, end for protection and, and circuit breaker failure protection. So let's start with the circuit breaker failure protection. It's here. The, oops, the advanced circuit breaker failure protection have to be put on the circuit breaker and the end fault protection with the EF we have also to put here 
Anything else? No. Yep. Uh, so now next step will be the disconnectors or the current on format doesn't matter. Oh, no. <laughs> oh let's See, like it. let's create this disconnectors. Function group circuit breaker. You have function group disconnector and the disconnector one and the second disconnector. And it is really a nice feature that we only have to do it once and then copy the bay and saves a little bit of work. Also, uh, well, quite new knot. Uh, in the meantime, I guess uh, implemented since one a year. But uh, me as a PLM for password protection uh, had to be wait for this feature some <laughs> years. So some features need a little bit more time, but now it's available. <laughs> Very fine. Okay, and I guess we still need a current transformer. Where is the current transformer? Uh, ah, here's a function group current transformer, and I need a current transformer. Okay, as Nina has already said, uh, two years ago, uh, we ha would have to create all those elements here once again for all the base. Uh, but now it will be possible to uh, copy the bay and therefore before we will copy the bay, uh, it's a good idea to save time to complete the first bay as kind of a typical as much as possible before copying because it saves a lot of uh, time, a lot of money in this case. Okay. Now, what we want to do, we have to go, let's start with the settings. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the settings, bay one, the circuit breaker, and here's the circuit breaker, circuit breaker failure protection. Okay, this will be too later. Um, what is important, the start via binary input mm -hmm. uh, we will do because it's used as an external circuit breaker failure protection. And I guess it's yeah. one or it's... it's, it's I choose it's the a, one channel. One yes. channel. Okay. We and a retrip T1. And retrip T1. Retrip after T1, it's no. So we have here... Uh, Parallel stat, I guess. Mm, parallel is. Parallel stat. And the thresholds, the delay T1 is 50 milliseconds. The delay T2 is 130 milliseconds. And the threshold, uh, where is the threshold? Threshold. Ah, the threshold phase current. Okay, we, we haven't assigned the current mm. transformer. Okay, this uh, has to be done. We will have a look uh, afterwards when we have done the assignment. Maybe a little bit problem uh, to make it too fast here at the very beginning. Okay, maybe not to uh, disturb you. Uh, we can't see the threshold at the moment because uh, up to now we haven't assigned the current transformer to the circuit breaker and we will do this later and then we will see also the default of the threshold. Okay, what's next? Routing and the unbalancing mode or is it? Okay. Uh, we will demonstrate the circuit breaker failure protection in the unbalancing mode, but that's already uh, the, uh, the default value. Okay, I guess that's about the settings. Mm -hmm. uh, Nina, we have forgotten the bus coupler differential. Uh, on the bus coupler differential protection, is that the coupler? Okay, we will do it later. <laughs> okay, it's uh, not so easy not to forget something, but I would say now we go to the routing. Mm -hmm. So information routing. Let's go to the bay and we will start with a disconnector, the circuit breaker and we will start with the position. And open high, high close tie. Was open the... high close tie. Then. And the close command for the end for protection. Protection is here. The close command. It's this one. High active. 
and the start of the circuit breaker failure protection. That's the fourth one. Mm -hmm. That's the start. High active. So we are finished with the circuit breaker for the moment. And let's go to the disconnector position. Next free one is a two plot one. Open also high. open high closed high, yes. Closed high. It's a disconnect of the status two. Oops, it's so uh, open high. Closed high. So and of course uh, we set the sources, the binary inputs. And uh, we need to route at least uh, the drip command of the circuit breaker. And to do this, I will collapse the sources. And here we have the binary in inputs. Let's go once again to the circuit breaker. And here we have the drip open command. And we will use two unlatched two binary outputs. So, hmm, what do you think, Nina? I am ready now to copy. <laughs> I would say so, yes. It's <laughs> okay. Let's try. Maybe we have something forgotten, so we will do it later. Okay. Oh, let's close. Sometimes it's a good idea to close all. Okay, we will start the copying here. We have here the bay one. Right, right mouse click. Say copy, click to the settings and say paste. And now I will be asked, uh, do you want to route sequentially from the next available slot of binary values, means binary inputs, binary outputs, and LEDs while copying? If you select no, the routing will not be copied. Maybe a sense uh, if you have anyway a different philosophy of routing your binary inputs and binary outputs, and uh, then you could say no. Uh, if it's fine for you to make it sequentially, you would say yes. So for us in our de demo, it's fine. So we would say yes. So we have already pay two. Um, let's oh, let's proceed. Copy. Based. Once again, I will say yes. And last feeder bay, copy, setting, paste. Once again, yes. And last one for the coupler, it will not fit uh, exactly, uh, but we will try it and say, copy and we will say once again settings paste and now maybe you may be confused uh, as we have not been asked uh, whether the, the routing of the binary inputs and binary outputs uh, should be copied. Uh, the reason is, be, uh, is that now there are not enough binary inputs and outputs available anymore. And if there are not enough, uh, we, or I decided uh, the philosophy not to copy it partly because then you have to uh, see anyway which should be copied and not. Uh, so I decided as BLM, okay, if there are not enough binary inputs and outputs, uh, don't copy any of the routings. And this has been done. Let's have a look. So opening the, oh, maybe first before I open the information routing, it's a good idea also to, to rename Bay one, bay three, it, it's fine so far. We will later synchronize it anyway. Uh, but here, not to be confused, let us rename it to coupler. And typically, you don't need a circuit breaker failure protection, which should be start uh, external. 
Uh, of course, we need uh, the inherent circuit breaker failure protection, so the circuit breaker, circuit breaker failure protection, which will be start by a trip of a bus on anyway, but uh, you don't need an external started uh, circuit breaker, mostly. Sometimes there are special uh, configurations where we will also have an external start. But uh, let's do here this demonstration, the most common things. And I will delete the external circuit breaker failure protection. And then we need a second CT in this Kepler. Ah, thanks. <laughs> I would have forgotten this. Okay, let's go here. The current transformer and here it collapsed. We have one current transformer up to now and we need the second current transformer and we place it to the coupler. So now we have two current transformer. Okay, and now maybe it's a good idea to create the bus coupler mm -hmm. differential protection. Uh, where function the extensions? Ah, uh, coupler yes. zone. Okay, here's a coupler zone so for the bus coupler differential protection. And I will place it to the coupler bay. Maybe, yeah, okay, as we are already in the settings, maybe let us. Uh, change the setting of the coupler zone. Uh, we have the threshold for the one phase. Uh, just for remember, if the restrain current is above this threshold for one bowl fault, it will be changed automatically into the overlapping uh, mode, where two, the two zones will be uh, cleared very quickly. And the threshold for the one phase, I guess it was five, five mm -hmm. amps. And the threshold for the multi phase, that means that the threshold of the restrain current when the bus coupler differential protection will be switched automatically to the overlapping mode. And this was, I guess, one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. That's one, and now we have to assign the routing for the coupler, as the routings of the coupler have not been copied. I open once again, and maybe let's have a look. Now, here you see uh, when all bays are really collapsed, uh, how the sequentially routing have been done by Dixie 5 during the copying. But now here it stops and the coupler has no routing. And maybe let's, oops, we had for each bay, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight binary inputs. But we have still three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven binary inputs uh, have been, uh, yeah available still anymore and that's the reason this one missing binary input uh, was the reason why Dixie 5 has decided not to copy any routing at all. Uh, but of course we need, but in reality it's sufficient because we don't need the external circuit breaker failure protection. So we have to do the routing before we start once again with the circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker failure, as uh, the circuit breaker position. Oh, oh where do I, uh, I need where to start <laughs> from? <laughs> okay, that's da, 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 da. position. Okay, so 5.18 is the next one free. So I will start open high, close high. Circuit breaker and the mm, close command from the end for protection. Exactly the close command. The five to twenty. High active, and we will continue with the disconnectors. Disconnector position and open high. 
close toy. Disconnect the two and position open high close eye but Nina really exactly has uh, <laughs> tailored the device what we need so there's really no binary input uh, <laughs> free anymore luckily I counted right <laughs> <laughs> okay and of course binary output uh, we should also say coupler of course uh, should open so we go to the circuit breaker and here we have the trip open command we once again collapse so and now we need which sorry how many binary inputs ah yeah okay here we can see so let's continue at 4.1. Oops. Tube open command 4.1. Let's again. Yeah. Okay. And I can you can go to the single line and so do I've the connection. No, Maybe. no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, we will, we will see. Okay, to finalize, now we have finalized uh, two of the three steps. We have uh, finalized in the first step uh, to create the single line diagram. And now uh, we have finalized to create uh, the, the device with all elements in the device, uh, including uh, the routing with the binary inputs and binary outputs. So there's still one major step left, and uh, that is uh, to assign the elements of the device with elements of the single line. And therefore, I am open the single line configuration. Here I have the device. And uh, I have already created an additional bus bar. And in the first step, I will assign the bus, bus zones of the bus bar with a single line bus bus. That's fine. So the bus zones is already assigned. And uh, to assign the elements of the bay, to the single line bay elements, uh, it's a very good idea um, to use this uh, drag and drop availability uh, possibility of the base. So you can here select the base, and we can make it in a two-step approach and drag them here to the single line element. Bay two. The coupler will be placed under the coupler. Bay three under bay three. And the bay four. Here. Over here. Two stage approach. Okay, now I have placed all the base uh, below the bay in the single line editor. We open the bay. I guess we don't need this at the moment. So let's start with the circuit breaker. We have to do this very carefully now, you remember? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Okay, let's start with the current information of the circuit breaker, and we will uh, assign every time the current, the first current transformer to the uh, current transformer inside the device. And now that's the reason you. Uh, it's a very good idea now to give a clear, meaningful name to your measuring points, and set the measuring point for bay one. And we will assign the circuit breaker. Up 
right, so circuit breakers, we will assign the disconnector one, we will assign the disconnector two, and we will assign the current transformer once again bay one. Okay. And now we have to do this for all four <laughs> other bays. That's maybe a little bit uh, exhausting. Uh, so if you need urgently a coffee, maybe it's a good time. Uh, but I have to do and I have to be concentrated now to assign also the remaining base to the elements. So once again, measuring point bay two. Circuit breaker, disconnector status one, disconnector status two, collapse with the current transformer. That's a bay two, if. Coupler, circuit breaker, doesn't matter which of the current transformer you will assign to the circuit breaker, you can use one of the two, so it's a coupler one, and the circuit breaker, circuit breaker is here, and the Disconnector one, disconnector two, current transformer one, and the current transformer two, of course, here now definitely the other one has to be selected. Couple two. Okay, looks fine. Same for the Obey three. Circuit breaker. Now it will be Obey three. Just that it's working. Current transformer. Disconnector one. Disconnector two. And current transformer. Current measuring point for base three. Almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> so, circuit breaker, last bay, bay four, circuit breaker, disconnector one. Transformer. So, <laughs> Bay four, okay, well <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, uh, to check whether it is really well done or whether I did maybe some mistakes, uh, you have to, to, to make a first possibility check. And if you go to the so-called filter view here, you have the filter view. And if you go here now to the 7SS85, uh, the algorithm within Dixie 5 to really interpret the topology of the substations the device has to be, uh, has to protect later is running. 
And uh, if something is implausible, when I forgot uh, something to assign or when I assigned a uh, measuring point of one bay to several bays or anything else, uh, it will be refused and you will get an yeah, error message or anything else uh, to, yeah, to check your configuration once again. And if it's fine, you will see, you will see exactly the substation the device will, will, will protect. And you will see only sys elements in the single line element which are assigned uh, to the 7 SS85 and which are well for the protection. So let's cross the fingers. Ah, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> this time it's uh, fine. And you see now uh, what is very interesting. Uh, you see in this so-called protection view now really only sys elements you have assigned to the device. You don't see this line disconnectors. You don't see any more the second uh, current transformer because you haven't assigned it. And this is also a very good check whether your configuration is right. Uh, maybe you forgot uh, to assign one disconnector, and it's a valid configuration. Uh, for example, if you forgot to assign qubit U, uh, then it's, uh, this feeder is assigned or can only be assigned to Maspa 2. It's also possible. But you by yourself have to check whether this is reality or is only uh, the result of a fault by yourself. And uh, maybe neither now we have to check. <laughs> uh, we have all the base. We have the coupler. We have the coupler with two CDs. We don't see uh, the voltage transformers. We are not interested in voltage transformers for differ as per differential protection. Uh, so it looks quite fine. And what else you see here also measuring points, the measuring points of the bay currents and the measuring points of the check zone, of the bus zone, and uh, about the coupler zone. And it's a very good idea now in this filtered view of the single line editor to arrange this measurement boxes. Because as you arrange it here now and will save, uh, in the same order, you will see the measuring boxes later uh, when you open the online monitoring in Dixie 5 or open the online monitoring in the web browser. So I will do this for Nina, so that he will have a good prepared online monitoring for the demonstration in the digital tool later. So Coupler PE1 is the left one, the coupler PE1 is the right one. Oh, that's wrong. That's day four. Why is it called day five? Did I make any? It's day four and five, the right ones. But I think ah it's, yes, here I have Bay Fay and oh yeah, okay. I I, ha <laughs> I have to rename this to Bay Three and Bay Four. Okay. I think we can accept yeah, that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I was a little bit confused for a little moment. So now where's the Bay? Oops, where's not the Bay Five? Five. No, so it's Bay Four. I miss Bay 5, here's Bay 5. <laughs> Maybe now time for a little break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yet. that's the arrangement of the measurement boxes and the very valuable uh, filtered view to also to make uh, a check whether your configuration is right. Uh, let me have a look what I still want to, okay, I want to synchronize, I will close. Uh, if you see here, for example, here the disconnector names, uh, that's uh, called Bay Zero. You want, I guess, in your project, you want to name them uh, to Bay Zero One and Bay Zero Two. Uh, yes, but. Yeah, uh, I think we have this done. <laughs> Bay Zero, it should be exactly project. Zero. 
a zero five. And if you select the device and you go here to the synchronize button, send the elements and the names and including the uh, primary rated current of the CDs will be passed from the single line uh, engineering to the elements of the device. It's only a single way uh, top down. Uh, it uh, says no logic as uh, to, to, to make it the different order from the device to the single line. It's only uh, really to forward the, the names, the settings from the single line to the device. I will push synchronize. And since the transformer ratio has been changed, the affected parameters may be adapted uh, to the change ratio. Uh, that's um, the reason why I have changed the primary rated current of the CD in the coupler from 1000 M to 2000 Ms. And as we haven't adapted any settings uh, at all, I can simply say yeah, yes. Okay, and now also this uh, red uh, coupler mm -hmm. is going. And we can see here that the name of the bus zones have been uh, are uh, equal to the name of the bus zones in the bus bar. And also here, the names of the disconnectors of the circuit breakers, they are equal to the names in the uh, device. So save. The settings maybe uh, to have a look whether also this primary rated current uh, has been changed correctly. We have a look to the 7SS85 settings power system. Let's go to the measurement point one. Here we see the rated primary current is 1000 M. And for the coupler, it has been changed by the synchronizing uh, with 2000 Ms. Now what is missing? I guess one setting. The yes, we wanted to adapt the setting for the bus coupler differential. For the bus coupler differential protection. Uh, no, bus coupler differential protection. Uh, no, we sorry, have already bus, changed uh, the, the minimum the differential power. threshold. Yes. yes. So we are in the most important settings. You remember this minimum differential current threshold should be higher than the highest load current of all feeders. It should, of course, be lower than the minimum short circuit current. And uh, for our demonstration, we have decided for a minimum differential current uh, of 1,200 amps. The rated object current is 1,000 amps. So the threshold of the differential current should be 1.2. And typically the same for the bus zone. 1.2. And maybe as we try to show the thresholds of the circuit breaker failure mm -hmm. protection before we assigned any CDs, Maybe we have also looked to the settings of the circuit breaker failure protection. Uh, let's go to bay one, circuit breaker. And now we can, we can see that there's a uh, threshold. The threshold for the phase current is uh, 0.5, means the threshold is 500 amps, and the sensitive is uh, 250 milliamps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Nina, do yeah, you maybe... want to do you have fun with this project now to demonstrate <laughs> digital twin? <laughs> yeah, maybe one more point to close the circle, show our customers how to export a SIM file. Okay. Good idea. Which I need anyway. And, later. Uh, that's so uh, where to um, go project uh, uh, on the on project on the device. In the project tree, right click on the device. Ah, okay. Sorry. Okay, project. Then export. And then, when I remember correctly, somewhere at the end, the last simulation one, yes. related data file. Uh, see user data. Yes, I would say let's do it to the project. Oops. 
system Dixie five projects. It sets should be the project of today. And I will locate the sim file here. And this is the file we uh, upload to the digital twin. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. Due to inconsistency in the file. Okay, this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have okay. here the sim. Oh, let's let's check. Overlapping. Advanced when using the bus coupler differential protection, cities must not be overlapping. Ah, yeah, this is a good, <laughs> a good idea. Let's go to the coupler bay. I guess it is the setting general. Yes, okay, and here it's marked red. Uh, set by default in the overlapping mode, but we have decided to show the bus coupler differential protection. And when we are using bus coupler differential protection, uh, there's no overlapping because then it makes no sense. So we will change it to no. We will change it to no. Mm. I think you don't just have to do the inconsistency oh. check again and everything mm. will be fine. I hope so. So I am quite optimistic. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, that's life. Okay, let's go once again. I have selected the device. I say project. I say export. I once again. And I nevertheless. Let's select. Okay, I have it already still okay. the project directory. Mm -hmm. Save. Export. Okay, now it's exporting. It takes uh, some time and it will also take some time for Nina to import in the digital twin. And I guess it's a good idea to use this as a small break. <laughs> yes, no, uh, not a, a bit of a break. But I think we will start with a short. Um, questions and answers round mm -hmm. first. Okay. Uh, so you can stay there. I try to find some space for my PC yeah. here. That was definitely a deep dive into bus bar <laughs> protection right now. And we already have some questions. Let's see how much time we will take for it because we want to continue the tutorial um, and start with a question that came in first. And yeah, I think you will see it soon yeah. a bit bigger right here. Um, the first one came in from TA and it was just complete description of bus bar protection and testing procedure for bus bar protection relay. That is, this is not a question, but I tried to take it. This is exactly what we are going to do today. Configure so and this. test. <laughs> so I hope that the webinar will answer your question if not, please hand it again. And uh, maybe uh, once again, the hint, uh, this demonstration will be recorded. Yes. <laughs> and of course, there's also explained uh, in the device manual how to configure a centralized bus bar protection, how to configure distribute it. Uh, and there are also commissioning hints, how to proceed for commissioning. Okay, there's not uh, described how to work with the digital twin. Okay, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's continue with the questions. Is the 7SS85 scheme performance on breaker and a half substations better than classical high impedance schemes? And how? And what CT specification or what CT accuracy class is recommended for such applications? Yes, I would. Definitely say, of course, it's better than uh, high beams bus bar protection. Where us for a breaker and a half scheme, maybe I would say a high impedance bus bar protection may also be applicable as, as it is from bus bar protection side. There are only two single buses, 
And single buses uh, can be also protected with high impedance. It, it, the disadvantages of high impedance bus bar protection is more, and especially in complicated uh, bus bar protection configurations like double bus bar, triple bus bar with transfer bus here, uh, high impedance is nearly impossible. And uh, CD dimensioning will come at the end. <laughs> it will yeah. become for high impedance the recommendation is there are the PX classes, uh, whereas for low impedance bus bar protection, there are several uh, CDs possible. I personally would recommend the 5 PR, mm -hmm. but will come uh, at the end of the day. So we will get more answers on that <laughs> question. <laughs> um, and then a question we even might answer a bit later because it's talking about testing. But let's take it like this. Um, WAEV wants to know, um, how does the external fault detection and CT saturation algorithm work? And how can you test this algorithm? Um, I would say for algorithms, I would recommend our second tutorial <laughs> to <laughs> watch the recording. <laughs> Uh, but we, I want to demonstrate later with the digital twin an external fault with the circuit breaker failure protection, uh, where I start the circuit breaker failure protection with a um, binary input. Perfect. Now the next one will be a bit tricky because the question is placed in French. And <laughs> est-ce que je peux installer de TC de classe différent so weiter? Um, and it. If I got it correctly with my <laughs> more, small remembrance of the French, of my French I had in school, so not technical stuff, um, can I use different CT classes or CTs from different vendors? That is hopefully the correct translation of the question. <laughs> and you will take that one um, yeah, also in the written. I guess uh, <laughs> this answer will really explicitly answer uh, in my Let's last see. tutorial. Right. Okay, so in the CT dimensioning, <laughs> yes. so we will talk more about that. I, so I guess it will be tuned. answered in, in the very first slide, so maybe we can postpone this. <laughs> oh, no, so that's our cliffhanger for the next webinar, yeah. right? Stay tuned, how to configure from different vendors and um, different classes. And the next one will be on April the 4th, so just mark your calendars. Uh, next one, the selection guide for BIBOs for bus bar differential. Is this a question? Is there a selection guide? Or maybe, or that's a tricky one from MB. Um, mm, it's I'm just sure half a question. Guide. Let's see. Now maybe once again, uh... This should have been uh, explained in our first tutorial how to count the number of binary inputs and oh, binary yes. outputs. Something that maybe there. some maybe. Uh, selection guide. Yeah. Uh, so also maybe uh, you are registered now for this tutorial, and that means you have also access uh, to the first uh, tutorial. Uh, and here we really yeah, explained in detail how the number of binary inputs, binary outputs have to be counted. Perfect. So once again, please refer to the first tutorial for the selection of BIs and BOs. Um, and then a um, question from SR, um, does it matter if you connect um, circuit breaker one to bus bar one or to bus bar two? I think it was the one um, between the bus bars, right? Mm -hmm. Something in between your presentation, no. rather in the beginning. Of course, both solutions are possible. It is just I choose this assignment, and um, because you we want consistent projects, I told Rainer that he should do it the same way. <laughs> yeah, but in reality, uh, away from our demonstration here, you give right. Uh, but in reality, it should be the same like in of your course. real primary substation. Yes, I think this is... <laughs> it yes. Should, it should be simply uh, <laughs> yeah. the name uh, of of the of the disconnector, uh, whether, whether it will be uh, assigned to bus bar 1 or bus bar 2 uh, should be in parallel to your primary substation. I think that is uh, the answer. And here it's just for demonstration to be consistent with the demo project uh, of Nina. Yeah, just need to be able to find it and identify it correctly <laughs> in your network. 
And MZ wants to know, where is the CT in the SLD? So where can you find the um, CT in the single line diagram? Uh, should I once again show? Right. Um, do we still um, we? <laughs> have the possibility to show it online? I think so, yes. It's there. Yeah, that's rather small to show yeah, as yeah, much information yeah, as possible, yeah, but you can CD. zoom so in. This is a CD I have assigned. Uh, this, this CD may be in reality also available, but not necessarily for the PASPA protection. And therefore, we don't have assigned. Maybe this CD is for distance protection or, or anything else. But these are the CDs and the single line element. And here in the coupler. Uh, here we have the two CDs in the coupler, and mm -hmm. here we have the CD. So sets, these are the elements uh, of the current and former in the single line. Thank you. So I hope that answered the question. And then AMB wants to know, please clarify with one CT method in the bus coupler, is it possible to achieve BC and fold when the BC is in close condition? Or oh, BC, a CB? Bus coupler? Ba bus coupler, Please okay. Let's clarify who is, okay. <laughs> they want uh, somehow to make a coupler with only one CD and they want to have bus coupler with info protection. And uh, yes, that's possible. And <laughs> once again, I am sorry, this has been explained in detail in our second uh, passport <laughs> tutorial by Nina okay. in, the, in the section <laughs> info protection. So here I give it's. Yeah, I can answer. It's possible. And how it will work, maybe a little bit too much time here, and you can uh, repeat it uh, watching the video of our second tutorial. Fine. And there in the section with the end fault protection, yes. right? I guess so it was quite at the end of the second yeah, tutorial. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so I, I think so. So just access the second tutorial and um, mm. yeah move there to this part about um, end fault protection. And now we have a question a bit longer and let's see if, um, if that works out for you. Yeah. So can you, ex MV wants to know, can you explain the interaction between the bus bar protection, inherent BF and external BF, specifically for the unbalancing mode of 50 BF? And if we choose unbalancing for operation mode BFP, does this apply to both internal and external 50 BF? Does blocking the bus bar protection influence the BFP? Breaker failure protection. Thanks, in this case, <laughs> as the algorithm for breaker failure protection uses the logic from the bus bar protection. So that's the first, second, and third question. Do the current thresholds from internal and external um, breaker failure protection have any relevance in this case? So the current threshold trip release equals the zero. And I'm really glad that you can also read this question <laughs> and that my experts can read the question. And let's see if we get any answer. <laughs> yeah, but I think it is a little bit uh, too to Tricky. less time to answer okay. this here correctly. And I once again have to recommend our second tutorial. <laughs> once again! <laughs> where we talked about uh, breaker failure protection. And how Perfect. Yes, yeah, this, this time uh, I explained it in the second tutorial. It, it, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess that was really a half an hour explanation exactly what has been uh, Ask here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, MP, just please access the tutorial number two. And I think the same applies for your next question. It's also coming from AMV around the circuit breaker and the, the end fault, um, if I see that question correctly. So, I think we will give the answer um, in a written format to, to, to reference mm. to the tutorial there. And let's see if we take the next one coming from LI. If we use the decentralized system with IC 61850 compliant, is it possible to have um, CBF, so circuit breaker failure, in central unit? What will be the disadvantages of the same? 
It is possible and there are no disadvantages, right? That's even better. <laughs> or at least it costs more function points. No, the no. price is not so. <laughs> okay. The disadvantage is a little bit that uh, if you have circuit breaker failure protection in the sending unit, uh, the limit of the maximum okay. base uh, is not 24, it's 20 only because then we get, uh, if you have 24 uh, base with uh, each a circuit breaker failure protection and the circuit breaker uh, in the sensor unit, we will have memory problems. So the disadvantage is only uh, the maximum uh, number of measuring points will be 20 instead of 24 on the other side. Maybe a little bit of more complicated goose engineering is necessary, but it's possible in principle and it will work. Okay, thanks. And I think as I has more questions, next one is, is it possible to elimin eliminate the switches in the decentralized system? Or system I without guess switches? They, I guess they mean uh, the Ethernet switches. Yes, <laughs> and ah. uh, it's possible since uh, version 9.20 uh, when we can use as communication topology uh, the HSR. And we will talk about communication topologies in our last tutorial. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I like about the series of webinars. Um, you bring in wonderful questions and we see here Oh, yes, we plan to answer that. So just stay tuned for the next webinar. And I think I take first the, the third one from Asai, um, wanting to know, is it possible to connect with you in case of any discussion about BBP? So directly, how to connect with you? Are they allowed to contact you via LinkedIn, for example? Yes, it's possible, <laughs> but I would uh, LinkedIn there are too many messages to be <laughs> <Yes>. honest. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I guess you have my uh, email address, and uh, the best would be uh, to contact me uh, if there are really detailed technical questions. Uh, I would prefer to contact me by email. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. And then and I guess, uh, same, same for you. <laughs> same for Nina. Thank you. <laughs> And next question coming in from BQ or came in from BQ. How many bay units can be accommodated in one central unit? Up to 20 uh, current inputs. That but, was uh, easy. But maybe bay units, I guess I mean bay in one. I'm not 100% <laughs> sure because they ask central unit and bay units. Mm. If they mean a and you have answered you have answered base in centralized bus bar protection mm. and uh, <laughs> i guess they mean, uh, they mean how many maximum number of bay units this to the distributed bus bar protection i wanted 100 for sure but bay units and central unit and not base and uh, centralized bus bar protection and okay bay units in our distributed uh, decentralized bus bar protection the maximum is 48 now okay that's even more than the mentioned 20. Yeah, okay. In the distributed <laughs> setup. Yeah. Okay, distributed so setup. depending on the setup, you yes. really yeah, need yeah. to be sure on that and really specify yeah. and clarify that, yeah. right? That's the question, the, the problem sometimes with this mm. question, you know exactly what you want to know <laughs> and it's sometimes tricky mm. to get it in a in a written question. So if you feel, no, okay. that was not Nina has question. answered because today we have uh, <laughs> the topic yeah. centralized passport protection. And Nina has answered <laughs> uh, what are the limits for centralized passport protection. <laughs> Absolutely correct. But uh, according to the wording in these questions, <laughs> I guess it's more related to the distributed passport protection. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I hope we got it. If not, get in contact. <laughs> and I think we take one last question. Um, is there any free simulator existing? Yes, I think we'll see you run through soon, right? <laughs> I will demonstrate it to the twin, yes, and it is possible to test or to get a trial license, I guess. But um, of course, to, to have it um, uh, to have a license for the digital twin it is not for free okay all right and um, so exists some demo version you it is 100. yeah with a limited um 
functionality okay, there okay. is uh, just to get it to know and play yes, around yes. a bit with it that's that's for free right yes yeah that's yes. perfect but i guess I what you demonstrate with this uh, import of contract fees <laughs> yeah, and so is... maybe not for free no, that's well that's powerful <laughs> we, we put some science in there i think um and does this question from GH mean a document manual utilization? I think it's a manual if we have a user manual PDF in French for the CPROTEC 7SS85. I'd search for it I know, in IMOL, right? Can you repeat what's again? <laughs> um, I think it's the question for a user manual in French. And I mean, we, we'll take that one um, in a I, written format and if not, I, give it to our I, French I, colleagues. I'm right? not 100% sure, but I'm 90% sure. I guess there should be a, a French. Okay, so we'll then, distribute a link yeah. to that document yeah, in the yeah. answered, answers. Um, we have now um, been uh, live for one and a half hours. Um, we will stay live for you. But I think um, our eyes here in the studio and eventually your eyes out there in front of the displays um, need a short break. We'll be back in a bit less than 10 minutes. So enjoy a short break. Give your eyes a bit of a rest and your ears. We'll take some in some fresh air <laughs> and let's meet again in, I'd say, nine minutes. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. 
All right, so welcome back after the break. I hope you had or enjoyed a short bio break. Um, we did get in some fresh air. And now let's see, we have seen that Rainer finally managed to successfully export the project. <laughs> and I think it was really helpful to see that just follow the red crosses and you are there where you need to change your project. And why this export was, export was useful, that is something that Nina will now present to us and show us the digital twin and how the Ciprotec 7 SS85 will look in there and what you can test in there. So let's go into the digital twin. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. So, yeah, in the next round about 60 minutes, I want to demonstrate you a little bit what we can do with our Ciprotec Digital Twin and how to test the 7SS85. So this are yeah, the mini agenda of the next 60 minutes. So I want to start with some um, stable conditions, injecting values um, with stable condition and demonstrate you the disconnected image in the web browser view and give you, a, of course, a general introduction about our digital twin. And then I will come to some fault scenarios. I want to start with an internal fault scenario, then come to an external fault with breaker failure protection, and um, then come to a fault in the bus coupler dead zone. And it will be a very good repetition of the explanation of the different algorithms of the one out of one <laughs> algorithm of the two out of two algorithm and also how the circuit breaker failure protection will work. Exactly. Okay, so yeah, can you please show my screen? Thank you. So this is the digital twin overview. And but first things first, um, under project, you can here with this button plus sim upload your sim file so this is what Rainer exported it can be imported here with this button um, i have already prepared this and upload the 7ss85 and here this is also a nice feature of the digital twin you can select the device firmware and the communication firmware with which the device is running and this it has the advantage that for example if there is a new version released and you want to retest um, something 
compare the old version with the new version or something like that, then you can just simply change here the firmware version and um, without any effort, you can test different firmware versions. Under um, test files, it is up, uh, possible to upload uh, Comtrade files and XML files. So um, this is also helpful if you want to retest a false scenario, you can just upload the Comtrade file via this um, plus button here. Or for example, if you want um, to test a sequence that you created with the Omicron state sequencer, you can upload it also here as XML file. And for our demonstration today, I also prepared some Comtrade files for the different fault scenarios. So here you can see different files are already uploaded for some internal faults, for the couple of faults. And um, yeah, this is um, a nice feature to, to test some things here with Comtrades. And under routing matrix, under this tab, then you have to make the connections between the Comtrade that you uploaded and the input of the device that you simulate. So for example, if I go here to, to the test scenario internal fault and go to the um, current view, and this, so in this case, the source would be the uploaded Comtrade file and the destination is the simulated device. And then you can set here via this matrix, the um, connection between the Comtrade and the device. And yeah, if your device is uploaded, your test files are uploaded and the connections are done, you're good to go and start a device by just selecting the device you want to simulate and use this start um, stop button here on the top. And this is also what I already did in the break. So we have here now our simulated device running. Um, and on this surface here, it is possible to directly inject current and voltages and to inject binary inputs. And um, you can, if you change here something, you can save these values that you, that you, dis, that you um, yeah, entered here to simulate, you can save them. And here I also created some um, different scenarios. I will come to this later, what, what I um, prepared here. And with this button, you can inject the values that are displayed here. So with this first button, you can apply changes automatically. So as soon there is a change made and this button here is pushed, then these changes will, send, will be sent to the device and can deactivate it again if you don't want to have this option. Um, the other option here is to send uh, to, to apply this value manually. Um, so if you change something, then you have to press this button to send this value to the device. With this button, you can reset the values and with this pause button, you can stop injecting values. And here under these options, then you have the um, possibilities to select the Comtrade files that um, you uploaded before and um, to select the um, stable conditions or safe conditions that you saved earlier here from this um, direct injection. Okay, so I would say, Gerd, can you please give me the slides again? And I will demonstrate you what are the yeah, stable conditions I want to, want to demonstrate. So the first one here is um, the scenario stable system, coupler closed. So here I am checking one amp in bay one flowing towards bus bar two, also one amp in bay two flowing towards bus bar two. And then these two currents are flowing through the coupler and away from the bus bar in bay three and four, also um, one amp for each bay. So this is called later on stable system coupler closed. The second um, condition here is um, with the coupler open. So in this scenario, there's one amp flowing towards the bus bar two in bay one and one amp flowing away from bus bar two in bay two. And 
same for base three and four. So one amp flowing towards the bus bar one in base three and one amp flowing away from bus bar one in base four. And I also want to demonstrate a disconnector shunt. So here in this example in bay one, both disconnectors are closed. And under these conditions, it is no longer possible to trip the two bus zones selectively. So here it is like one overall zone. And in this case, it is all colored in red because the preferred system here is the bus bar one. Okay, so much about the theory. Uh, jumping back to the digital twin, please. Thank you. And now I want to show you real quick these two um, stable conditions I prepared. So let's start with the coupler close scenario. So I just select here this uh, pre-saved um, condition. And here, of course, also these binary um, values are um, set like displayed in the single line on the slide. So I sent this value to the device. And now I want to go to the um, online web browser. Okay, just redo the login again. And I want to show to you the single line diagram. So this is here, single line. And now, um, you see exactly the colors as Rainer also um, has chosen before. So bus bar one in red, bus bar two in green. And the bays are assigned as shown on, on the slide before. So bay one, bay two are connected to bus bar one. The coupler is closed. And bay three and bay four are connected to bus bar one in red. And here, um, on the bottom, you see the injected current values for all the CTs. And on the right side, you see the differential and restraint current for the bus zones. And you see also, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, well-known issue in the web browser that at the moment, uh, the differential and the restraint current uh, of the coupler zones are not available. It's available in the, if you go to the online monitoring in Dixie 5, but uh, due to a defect, it's at the moment not available in the web browser. Uh, online monitoring, it will be fixed soon. Exactly. And the check zone, last but not least, is uh, visible. Okay, so let's change the condition. So I go from coupler close to coupler open and apply these values. And then you can already see now the coupler disconnectors and the coupler circuit breaker are open. And now the current would be flowing like this. So towards the bus bar two in bay one and away from bus bar two in base two. <laughs> and the same for base three and bay four. So you can keep these two stable conditions a little bit in mind because these conditions are always the pre-fault conditions um, in the test cases I demonstrate later. But last but not least, in the single line view, I also wanted to show you a disconnector shunt. So therefore I go to the binary inputs and yeah, for example, go to the bay one binary inputs. Here you can see at the moment, the disconnector one is in position um, closed. The disconnector two is in the position open here. So I remove the open high signal and activate the check box for the closed high signal and send this to the device. And now you can see everything is red because here in bay one, we have this disconnector shunt. And um, as I told earlier, it is no longer possible to um, selective trip the bus zones. So here, because we only have the um, differential and restraint values for bus zone one and no longer for two separate bus zones. Okay, so I think we are good to go to test the first fault and get, please give me the slides again. Keep the studio team busy here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So this is what I want to demonstrate first. Three-pole internal fault on bus bar two 
with a high fault current. So this are our, our pre-fault condition as explained earlier with the coupler open. And then let's assume there's a fault on the bus bar two between bay one and bay two. And this leads to a current that is increasing and now flowing from both directions towards the fault. So I increase here the value from one amp to five amp and um, turn the direction of the second CT around. So both currents are flowing towards the bus bar now. And for the bus bar one, everything still stable. So we only want to simulate a fault on the bus bar two. Okay, thank you, Get. So we start with the stable condition coupler open. And I want to replay the COM trade internal fault. One of one. One of one. I think it is will get clearer later why I named it one of one. <laughs> so I press this uh, start button to replay this COM trade. Okay, you already see here are some red LEDs glowing uh, for the operate A, B, and C. So we have a three pole oh, maybe, fault. Maybe you read it's very, maybe too small, but uh, the, mm -hmm. the LEDs, uh, the meaning of the LEDs, maybe you can read them. Uh, it's, it's the operate general from the bus differential and the operate phase A, B, and C. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, the, the disconnectors are now in e intermediate position because the com trade file is finished. So um, yeah, to change it back from intermediate to stable conditions, I just go back to my prepared um, current values to fix this. Okay, everything fine again. So yeah, let's take a look at the fault that we tested. And therefore I go to the web browser again. And this time I go to the fault log in the web browser. So I open the fault lock and take the one with the newest timestamp, so number two in this case, and scroll down because it is sorted from newest to oldest. So the newest one is the top one, the oldest one is the one on the bottom. So here we go. And we see there is a bus bar fault on bus two, and phase B and C were the first one that give this um, operate. And uh, as we have a, a fault on the bus zone two and uh, bay one and bay two are connected to bus zone two, these are the two bays that are receiving a trip command. And this is what you see here. And of course, also, as we have a bus bar trip, the inherent circuit breaker failure protection um, picks up. And these, these messages here are also worth to mention because they show the position of the disconnectors and the circuit breaker at the time of the trip. So this helps later on to analyze this fault and check, okay, which disconnectors were closed at the, at the moment of the trip and which so, were open. So typically when there's in the reality uh, a bus bar fault, so that means a whole bus zone has been tripped. Uh, all the management and the operational uh, staff have to work uh, to bring power to all consumers once again. And they will switch, switching the disconnectors to uh, ensure the power to all consumers. And uh, when this is reached, uh, then the, will start the analysis of what really happened. Was it a wrong trip by the bus bar protection? Mostly not. Uh, what, what really happened? And to make this investigation, it's very helpful to know really how was the disconnector image, uh, which, disc, uh, which feeder was assigned to which bus zone at the moment of the trip uh, to make the analysis. And uh, really, really to, to log this information, we implemented uh, to give the position at the, at the tripping time uh, and save it in the fault log. Okay, let me do a quick step before I download the record because I don't clear my download folder. <laughs> okay. 
so that you don't get confused. Okay, now let's have a look at the fault record. So I go to the web browser again and to the home button. And this time I jump to recording. So here, of course, I'm also interested in the fault number two. It is possible to display this fault record directly in the web browser. But um, today I want to download it and open it directly in Zika, um, so offline. And therefore, I use this download option here. Take some seconds. Okay. And then I go to this download folder and here is our newly um, downloaded CFG file. Open it with double click. And now you see the currents in Zgra. And the first question I want to clarify is why uh, only phase B and phase C pick up at the beginning and not all three phases at the same time, for example. And therefore, I want to put all the phase currents in one diagram. And this is possible if I simply um, select the, the signal and drag and drop it to the first diagram in this case. And I do the same for the phase C current. So click on this and drag and drop. And of course, this is a little bit small now. Um, so I increase the diagram height to 100 millimeters. Give Sigra some time. <laughs> it is a big record. Of course, needs a little bit. And now I want to zoom in. Looks really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I think now it is, yeah, almost the first sight is getting clear why phase B and C are the first one to operate. Phase B is here the, the blue one, phase C is the green one, phase A was then the yellow one. And here you can see if you compare phase B and phase C with phase A, you can see that those two phases have really a higher slope, a greater slope than the phase A. And this, of course, have an influence that on the on the trip time, I would say. OK, then second step, I want to have a look at the differential and the restraint current. And the fault happened on bus zone 2. So I scroll down until bus zone 2 comes. Uh, Check, okay, I think here we go. <laughs> yes, this looks good. And I um, will have a look at the values of phase um, B in this example. So I just want also to have the restraint and the differential current in one diagram. So I put this here and optimize a little bit and increase once again the height of the diagram. Okay, zoom a little bit out once again, I would say. Yes, as soon as Sigra is finished. Yeah, still working. Still working. <laughs> yes, now we good to and go. Yeah, here, while Nina is zooming a little bit out. It's once again, I want to repeat uh, what I have already stated uh, in our last tutorial. Uh, in Seagra, in every folder record, uh, we see at one side the differential current, uh, the differential current, that's a green one, and the restrain current is not the calculated restraint current. If you remember, uh, I have explained uh, we are working not with the calculated uh, restraint current. The algorithm is every time working with the so-called modified stabilization current. The modified stabilization current is the same like the calculated stabilization current. As soon as the calculated uh, stabilization current is higher or is and is increasing, as soon as the calculated 
uh, stabilization current is decreasing. It's not going sinusoidal uh, decreasing. It's decreasing a little bit in a linearized way. You see it here. Uh, this decreasing after after the zero of the, after the black line. Uh, that that's no sinusoidal uh, decreasing. It's really this decreasing in this uh, linearized modified way. Exactly. Though when it's uh, increasing again, so yes. And here once again, the calculated uh, stabilizing stabilizing current is higher than the modified, and then it's uh, decreasing again. But still more, we are seeing here not the modified stabilization current. We are already seeing the modified stabilization current multiplied with the stabilization factor. Means if the differential current is above here with the line in the fault record, we can directly state we are in the driving area. So as soon as the differential current is above the characteristics of the modified stabilization current multiplied with the stabilization factor, we can say, okay, we are in the driving area. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay, so I will continue. And uh, once again, uh, if you remember, the one out of one algorithm, the one out of one algorithm has to be triggered by a jump of the stabilization current. And you see here, uh, maybe once again, what's, uh, uh, what are the numbers on, on, on the y uh, on the y axis? It's, uh, I guess here, it's that's 10. This is 10, yes. That's 10. So you see here really a very big jump. So we are, we hear from the blue line under the black line, it's one, one and a half milliseconds. So that means we have a jump of the stabilizing current within one and a half milliseconds uh, of uh, nearly 10, uh, yeah, 10 times the nominal current. And this is even multiplied with the stabilization factor. So that means that's really a jump higher than uh, 10 times the nominal current. And at the same moment, we are in the tripping area. That means from the very beginning, the differential current is above uh, the restrain current multiplied with the stabilization factor. So that's really a clear indication this will for sure trigger a one out of one drip by the bus bar protection. And from the fault inception, so that's here uh, at the blue line, here mm -hmm. that's around the fault inception. Uh, the black line, that's zero, that's the tripping. Uh, of course, the tripping of the algorithm without the delay of the binary inputs. So the algorithm has uh, seen this tripping uh, within one and a half milliseconds in this case. Okay. Okay, and this is happening with the one out of one algorithm, and this is why I called this test case uh, internal trip one minus one. Okay, enough about this fault. I need the slides again, please, exactly. So um, we are now looking at a one pole internal fault on bus bar two with a small fault current. So the starting conditions, the pre-fault conditions are exactly the same. We have these stable conditions, coupler open. And now what happens is a fault on bus bar two, same position. But in this case, I only want to simulate a small fault current. That means I don't increase the values. And I only want to simulate a one pole fault. And um, that means I just change the direction, as you can see here um, in Bay 2, of phase A current in Bay 2. So now there is a current flowing towards the fault in Bay 1 and Bay 2 but only with an amplitude of one amp and only for phase A. Okay, thank you, Gerd. Now I close this record and go back to the digital twin. Okay, as I said, I want to start with the pre-fall condition coupler open. So I inject this values and clear the LED so that we can check that everything is fine at the beginning of the fault. And now I select the contrade file internal fault two minus two. 
and replay this record. And here you may already see the difference. Now we only get here this operate signal LED for phase A. Okay, now it's finished. I jump back to the stable conditions. And we will have a look at the fault. So I go back to the web browser and home. And here I open the fault lock in the first step again. Fault lock, and now this is fault number three. I scroll down to the bottom, uh, delete here this download information. And now we can see here, once again, it was bus zone two, and of course the check zone, the trips, but only for phase A. Of course, the trip is nevertheless a three-pole trip, but um, here this, this fault was only triggered by phase A. And of course, here once again, um, the trip signal is issued to in bay one and in bay two, because these are the two bays that are connected to bus zone two. And of course, in this two bays, also the inherent circuit breaker failure protection will start simultaneously. So much about the messages. Now I want to open the record again. So I go to recording and fault recorder and download this time the fault number three. Okay, everything is finished. I go to my download folder and open the record number three. Maybe now we can see a two out of two folder. <laughs> If everything went right, yes, we should see a two out of two fault. Um, I don't want to talk much about the phase current, just a small hint. Here you can see in the phase A current that uh, um, the amplitude stays the same, but the phase changes. You can see this here. But now I go directly down to the differential and the restraint current. Once again, of bus bar uh, of bus zone two. Crawl down a little bit. Bus zone one. Really, a lot of signals for bus bar projection here. <laughs> bus zone two, and now, of course, we are looking at the phase A current because this is the one where the fault happens. So I put this in the same diagram. Double click on the diagram to increase the height. And of course, zoom in as soon as Sigra is finished. So now we can analyze it to out of two algorithm. And if you remember correct, the two out of two algorithm will be triggered for the first threshold exceeding. Uh, when the one out of one algorithm can't apply, uh, means that we have no jump of the, oh, thanks, Red, very <laughs> nice. Uh, so that uh, the, the jump of the stabilization current. So maybe let's start with the jump of the mm -hmm. stabilization, uh, stabilization current. The stabilization current is a blue one. And uh, I think it's very clear that uh, we have absolutely no jump of uh, stabilization current. So uh, one out of one algorithm is not possible. And uh, we see here, maybe here at the beginning of the fault. Mm -hmm. So here, not the beginning of the fault, so, uh, when mm -hmm. the realistic differential current starts. Okay, and uh, when, and then the, one, the two out of two algorithm will be triggered when we have the first threshold exceeding. Maybe we can really hear step by step. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. It's it's fine. And here we have the first possibility. Uh, and here are a little bit on the right side uh, to be a little bit more realistic. And now we will start the two out of two algorithm. And uh, if you remember, as a two out of two algorithm, one threshold exceeding is enough. And, but we 
to be sure to start the second uh, to make a measurement window in the second half with we are starting in uh, and rest and break of the measurement of eight milliseconds. And now I can't read it. So we have between the yellow and the blue line uh, eight milliseconds. Yes, yes. So, uh, the state time eight milliseconds is for 50 hertz. Of course, we are testing here with a 50 hertz system. Uh, for 60 hertz, it would have been six milliseconds. And after the state time of eight milliseconds, we will have a measurement window of six milliseconds. And within the six milliseconds, uh, we need four threshold exceedings. So you can see at the very beginning, when the measurement window will be opened again, uh, we will have no threshold exceedings. So it starts uh, here, uh, Nina, you can sign when, Okay, here, beginning from this moment, we will have a threshold exceeding it again, and then we need four, uh, I think, uh, could be quite fine. So that really at the tripping times, uh, there should be four threshold exceedings uh, possible. So all in all, if you maybe once again with the blue cursor go at the beginning of the, of the fold, and set the time now it's 18 or I can't read it. Uh, 16, 16, 16 milliseconds. Uh, really the tripping time of the two out of two algorithms plus uh, round about four milliseconds for uh, type F binary outputs. So we have uh, overall tripping time of the two out of two algorithm of yeah, uh, 20, 21 milliseconds depends on. Okay. okay. Now we had also a very fine repetition of the one out of one algorithm and the two out of two algorithm. Okay, then lights, please. Thank you. So the third scenario I want to demonstrate is an external fault in day four. So we start once again with the stable conditions with the coupler open and um, there's flowing current towards the busbar in base three, um, over busbar one and away from the busbar one in bay four. And now let's assume here is a fault and um, the current, for example, increases that is flowing towards the fault and we receive a start signal for the circuit breaker failure protection because, for example, um, a remote and differential uh, protection system tripped Try to trip this line and the breaker failed. Okay, thank you, Gert. So close this record and jump back to the digital twin. So stable condition coupler open are once again our pre-fault condition. So I check these values and clear the LEDs. And this time I don't want to to demonstrate this by replaying a record, but uh, directly changing the values that I apply here. So I was talking about a fault in bay four, an external fault in bay four. So I change here, go to this um, site for bay four, and we say we increase the current that is flowing towards the fault. So I increase the number here from three uh, from one to three and if you have these um, buttons here activated he automatically chooses the same value for all three phases and he will also balance the angles correctly if you want to change the, um, one should change it individually you, you can just deactivate this box and then you can um, change each value separately but in our case leave it like this so i checked apply these values and then we go to the binary signals of course in a real case scenario it wouldn't take that long <laughs> but i think yeah okay for this test and then i have to yeah search the right binary input signal these are a lot <laughs> this will be the most challenging part for the day <laughs> <laughs> so we are talking about v4 and Luckily, I practice it. So here it is. <laughs> um, we are in day four in the circuit breaker. And this here is the circuit breaker 
failure start signal. So I activate this checkbox here and send these values to the device. And you see here, now we get this repole operator once again. I can deactivate it, send these values again. And yeah, let's have a look what happened. So I go to the web browser once again and open the fault lock in the first step. So now it is fault number four. I scroll down to the bottom. And now we see here the circuit breaker failure protection pickup. And yeah, 50 milliseconds later, there comes the retrip of T1. And in parallel, the, uh, the T1 at uh, T2 timer, sorry, is started. And we see here this um, T2 time elapses. And we get the operate in this case from bus zone one. Once again, in phase B and C first, but phase A will sure come later. And um, Assigned to bus zone one is bus bay three and bay four. And of course, these two bays are the one that will trip. And just to remember, we have selected uh, the breaker failure protection mode of unbalancing mm -hmm. and not so I agree. And this will be interesting when we have a look in the fault record. Exactly. And this is what we're doing right now. So I go to recording here and download the comtrade file of fault number four. Good, this time I want to start by looking at the binary signals. I don't know how good it is to, to see for you. Um, here, interesting is um, the circuit breaker start signal. So this was the binary signal that we activated. And here is the retrip T1 after... After who? <laughs> <laughs> I <clears throat> use this cursor here to the start of the signal and um, cause this second one to measure a difference. And then you see it is um, 50 milliseconds. And this is, of course, what we set here. And um, let's go to the trip T2. This should be 130 seconds. And I would be surprised if it would be <laughs> something different. So now here we have these 130 seconds as the delay for T2. And yeah, really, not much later comes the operate of the bus bar protection. But let's have a look at the differential and the restraint currents. This time um, it happens in the trip. Happens Maybe uh, once again, before we go to mm -hmm. the differential current, uh, do you have now the yellow cursor on the trip T2? The yellow yes, cursor okay, is so Exactly fine, because uh, the trip T2 now will stimulate the unbalancing of the bay current. And so let's see how the timing is. Okay, uh, bus zone one was the one that was um, relevant for this fault. So let me just scroll to the bus zone one. And here, yeah, Maybe we just look again at the bus um, of, of the phase B or C because that was the, the fast ones. Um, I select here phase B and put it in one diagram once again. And increase the height. And zoom in.
Now maybe we need the operate time also as a reference. The operate of the um, bus bar protection. So I put this um, cursor here on the operate of phase B. And the yellow cursor is on the um, trip T2 signal. What I'm a little bit astonished in this example because we have seen it a lot of times on a different way. I do not know, maybe the timing of the digital twin. It, it's a little bit surprising that the differential current already starts before the trip T2. I, I do not know the reason at the moment. Normally, the differential current should be should start uh, at the mo uh, immediately after the trip T2, but not before. But okay, so this may be a reason also in the timing of the simulation. I do not know. Normally, this should not happen. Okay, but here with the trip T2, the unbalancing will start. And uh, before it was uh, uh, external fault only. And uh, via this doing this unbalancing, uh, we will. Uh, how to simulate uh, it uh, to an internal fault so that with the mechanism of the bus differential protection uh, we will trip uh, the associated bus zones and uh, the restraint current is the magenta one i would say and once again that's very important with unbalancing you will never have an one out of one trip as with unbalancing you will have no jump of the stabilization current because the jump of the stabilization current will start typically at maybe at the beginning uh, when the circuit breaker failure protection picks up at all but not uh, in our case the delay time t2 130 milliseconds later so when nina already have uh, placed the yellow cursor is when due to the unbalancing uh, we have the first time the threshold exceeding. That means the two out of two algorithm will be triggered. So that's at the yellow point. And then once again, eight millisecond dead time. So the two out of two algorithm. So here, so and here we will start once again a measurement window of six milliseconds. Uh, so for at least around about one millisecond, we will have no threshold exceeding. But immediately after, uh, we will have the threshold exceeding and at the yellow point, that's the tripping. Uh, that's uh, six, six milliseconds that's six later. Milliseconds again. And, uh, uh, okay, that's, that's fine. So we, we see it's absolutely fine to have four threshold exceeding. And the trip, okay, it's a little bit later. Uh, we see here because we don't know how it is synchronized our uh, protection cycle really with the, with the measurements. And here is a tripping around about half a uh, millisecond later than when the measurement yeah, window 6.3 ends. Yes, okay. So here really at this point, we will trip the associated uh, bus zones after the unbalancing of the bay current. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Okay, then let's have a look at the bus coupler faults. So, um, here I have two fault scenarios uh, to speed it up a little bit. I want to explain for both cases the theory at fault for first and then do the testing. So the first um, fault case would be a fault in the dead zone of the bus coupler in the three pole fault. So the pre-fault conditions would be that current is flowing towards the bus bar two in bay one and bay two flowing through the coupler and flowing away from the bus bar one in bay three and in bay four. And now let's assume there is a fault here on this position. So between the two CTs in the coupler, and this means here is the fault. So the current is flowing towards the fault. So now the direction in bay three and four and in the right um, coupler CT changes. And now from both directions, the flowing is again, uh, the current is flowing again towards the fault here. And this is happening three pole. The second uh, couple of fault I want to demonstrate is almost the same, but one pole. So here completely same pre-fault conditions. And now um, the direction of the current in base three and four are changing and in the right coupler city. 
and now current is flowing towards the fault from both bus bus, but in this case only one phase, so only for phase A. Okay, thank you Gerd. So let's close this record and go to the digital twin. Clear these LEDs and we say we want to start with the couple of closed condition. So I select this one and apply these values. Maybe we can also have a quick look on the display. So here you can see these free fault condition, the coupler is closed. And now I select at first the coupler's repole fault and replay it. Okay, you see the coupler CT has opened. We have an operate, a three pole operate, of course. And now it is finished and I change back to the stable conditions coupler closed. And I think this time it is sufficient to only look in the fault record, uh, in the fault lock. Look. Real quick. And therefore I go back to the web browser again and open the fault locks. Now we have five entries. The number five is the newest one. I scroll down to the bottom and now you see here there's the operate from the coupler zone and um, since we have these two thresholds um, in the bus coupler differential the first one was for three pole faults and it was set to one amp this means as soon as we have a differential current above this threshold and for three phases then we will immediately trip both bus zones in overlapping mode. And the second threshold was set to five amps and this was the threshold for the one pole faults. And that means as soon as we have exceed these five amps, then we will also get to overlapping mode for one pole faults. But in, in between, in, so for currents smaller than five amps, um, and to win one pole fault. And one pole fault, of course. <laughs> there will be um, a selective tripping with the end fault protection involved. But first test scenario was three pole fault. So, and this is why we see here this operate for both bus zones. And let's demonstrate the second scenario. Uh, the coupler close scenario is already active. And now I jump to the um, couple of fault one pole and replay this one. Ah, maybe I clear the LEDs. And now we expecting really a so-called sequential tripping of first only tripping the coupler, applying the end fault and then only the faulty zone should be cleared. Exactly. Okay, now it is finished. Go back to the stable conditions. And you already see here, um, it is only the LED for phase A active. And let's have a look at the fault lock. It's number six in this case. And here you see only bus zone one drips finally. Can we see the trip of the circuit breaker first? In the lock. The trip open command, couple uh, circuit breaker, circuit. You mean this one? This is a couple, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's here's V84. And uh, when sent the bus on one trip? Here. 458, okay. Okay, fine. Okay, so these are the fault scenarios I want to demonstrate. Uh, maybe just some small hints about the digital twin. Uh, today I demonstrated the centralized setup, or we demonstrated the centralized setup. It is also possible to simulate a distributed digital twin um, with up to 20 devices if you have the digital twin L license. Okay, then I would say uh, we are finished with our second block and have time now for your 
questions Great. and then there will be an uh break, another break perfect you can stay there oh, okay <laughs> you don't have to, to leave the stage <laughs> i think it's it's fine for us three and there are questions i think we still have some of the first round and continue to um try to answer them chronologically if that's fine for you um so the first one is interesting. Can one get the TX file? Um, so will you share that? <laughs> sure. Yes, okay. I would say so. So yes. just get in direct mm -hmm. contact. I think we will not be able to put it as an attachment, but it will be fine as a um, direct mail. And then it's a question of why, which circuit breaker is connected to which bus bar? Oh, I think somewhere in the model it's circuit breaker two. So the question was from um, GK. And why the circuit breaker two is connected to bus bar one and circuit breaker no. one connected to bus bar not, two. Not, but not, I not, guess it was not, vice versa, not, right? Not mm. circuit breaker <laughs> disconnected. QB is a, QB is a uh, that's true. QA is a, typically is a circuit breaker. Mm. But I guess uh, we have already answered this. Also. It's Perfect. Both it doesn't matter, it is only uh, for the demonstration and yeah. in reality it should apply to the substation. How it's should be marked there. as... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think it was a similar one. Yeah. And um, then the question from N NHS is just a configuration about bus coupler differential. And I think we've seen that how to configure, right? A small hints we gave also today and in the last tutorial. Yeah, so in tutorial two, more information about the bus bar, bus coupler um, differential protection. And then the next one, how many different, coming from FJ, how many different CT ratios possible at sitting? At sitting or for the setting might, might be a typo and i think ct dimensioning will follow in our next part of this yeah, session right yes you're right but i think uh, this answer will not directly be answered but it's a ct ratio how many says no maximum number okay so in principle you can give a different ct ratio to each ct uh, you're configuring perfect thank you and then the next question came in from IK. Is it possible to change significant a significant feature after I got the short code of the relay? Let's say if a bus bar protection had been ordered and there's a change in the single line diagram from the client. Um, yes, this is possible. You can um, order a so-called DAF file um, via the Protect 5 configurator and there you just um, have to enter your serial number of your device select the significant feature you want mm -hmm. to to have in the future and yeah proceed with the order process okay so it's possible to change that great to know and then am hm wants to know where does the ct star points face for bus bar protection uh, there's not a, both is possible. The CT star point could be based uh, both uh, be in direction of the bus bar or in direction of the line, but you have to configure it uh, in your single line diagram. Uh, when I remember in our configuration, we every time configured it as uh, Dorbert's line. I think that's a, that's a default configuration. Mm -hmm. But you can select the current transformer in the single line, and then there, with the right mouse click, there is, I guess, invert or inverse the direction of the CT star point, and then you can change it to the direction of the bus bar. Okay, thanks. The next one is a bit more tricky, I think. At least it's a longer question that came in from VB. Could you please explain a little bit more about CT connection? So grounded towards bus bar or line, because VB is a bit confused. And then it's a lot of information from the manual. And I'm not sure if I will, if it's helpful if I read all of this to you, 
or if we just take this in general. So explain a bit more about the CT connection and then you might give a detailed answer in a written format. Yes, uh, I think when I have already started, that's yeah, indeed a little bit uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. It's also written in the manual, but I agree it's maybe a little, a little bit complicated uh, to make maybe a, a summarize. How to change the direction of the city star point, I have already explained. Uh, it will be more, a little bit more complicated if we are going to the IC650 compliance solution where you might have an independent protection device as, as a merging unit uh, with a different uh, definition of the direction of the star point. And this also was not very clear at the beginning defined in IC61850. Uh, so we decided uh, as every time when something is not completely clear, uh, so we decided to make it as a, as a setting to also to be compliant okay. to third party merging unit and so on. Uh, the major thing is this neutral point in direction of the reference object uh, should be both in the merging unit and in the center unit uh, set either to no or to yes. But I think it's worth here uh, to give a written answers I would prefer. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And the next one is a rather short question. Let's see how long the answer will be. So SB wants to know, how do you handle mismatch of the CT polarity in the single line diagram? Mismatch of CT polarity. So if one is looking in the one direction and the other one in the other, maybe? Mismatch, okay. So the CT polarity, I guess the CT polarity is the direction of the star point. Uh, what means mismatch? It could be in this direction or the other direction. More or less, it leads to a uh, multiplic multiplication of the current with minus one. So I do not know what is the reference. Uh, let's, let's state uh, direction of the line is plus one and direction towards bus bar uh, is all the currents will be uh, multiplied with minus one. And I set uh, the background here because in reality, this leads to an, a change of the polarity of the, of, the, of the current, which will be measured by the device. And uh, you have to give this knowledge to the device via the symbol in the single line editor and uh, whether it's towards busbar or towards line will be at the end handled. Uh, one will be multiplied with minus one. Okay. Then we have a question in German um, bezüglich dezentraler Sammelschutz. So I tried to put this in English, but I'm not sure if I need, have all the necessary vocabulary for that. Um, so we talk about decentralized bus bar protection without own CTs, so current transformers. So, and then the question is, is there a symbol um, for the, yeah, Eintrub? And that's where I <laughs> struggle. Um, maybe my experts here have an idea, but I think we'll take that question offline mm, and then maybe my German is not good enough to really <laughs> understand what is oh, meant by Einschub. No. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we take that offline and go on a one-on-one -on -one discussion and then both of you can talk in German to each other. That's eventually even easier. Then let's see. CT, but I guess that's not a current transformer, but that's a name, <laughs> wants to know, is it possible to see all IEC 61850 set settings corresponding um, of your configuration? Um, in our example, we didn't do any IEC 61850 uh, <laughs> settings because um, we had the centralized approach where all the currents are directly connected to the 7SS85. And yes, I inject, uh, inserted this BB module, or we had mm. this BB module available, but we don't, uh, didn't make any settings for this. Okay. This case. Thank you. 
so we cannot show it. It's possible to have them, but we mm -hmm. cannot show them. We <laughs> can show the IEC 61850 settings uh, when we will demonstrate our distributed buster protections, and we yeah. will have IEC 61850 settings available. Yes, more next see, webinar, next right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> as we already told you, stay tuned, watch out for our next webinar on the 4th of April. But now, stay tuned right to this one because we continue the round of questions and answers and we still have a third part planned for you for today and then tdm wants to know um eventually it's even already done could you better explain the functionality of coupler zone and its settings i think it's also uh recommend to watch our second webinar the second webinar i, I was just <laughs> thinking about i think this couple of zone mm. was was mentioned a few times in the second tutorial so it's worth to um take a look at that again and if you ha still have questions then just contact the experts of course. <laughs> yes you are there um and okay wants to know can we use normal auxiliary contacts for C protect bus bar protection? I think the question is what really are normal auxiliary contacts? <laughs> uh, I would say yes, uh, but as normal auxiliary contacts, I, we recommend normally to use the so called uh, limit switches when really we have the closed or high command really at the moment when uh, the auxiliary contact or when the primary switch is at the end position that is called limit switches and if it is, is normal auxiliary context <laughs> i would say yes uh, there sometimes maybe also overlapping auxiliary contacts uh, is uh, expressed as normal auxiliary contacts but they can also be used <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you and then the question from ak um is the no it's does the c protect 7 ss85 have rstp protocol instead of prp um, rstp protocol is possible uh, but uh, we can't say that the 7 ss85 uses rstp instead of prp rstp is an available protocol 7SS85 is a fully compliant uh, modular devices with all functionality of the Protect 5, and you can uh, select RSTP. Uh, but RSTP, once again, uh, <laughs> Outlook for our next webinar is not is not a possible communication layout to have redundancy of the busbar protection. Here, only PRP is uh, possible. Or for the answer, have seven SS85 RSTP protocol instead of PRP, I would simply say, uh, in the first step, uh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> you have HSR, but all this communication layout uh, will be really uh, explained in detail in our next webinar. But all is possible PRP, star communication, uh, HSR, where is the uh, Grandmaster clock be located, Grandmaster okay, clock yeah. with uh, GPS, without GPS, and uh, I think we have a separate webinar for this. And it's, it's really a lot of stuff uh, yeah. can be answered here now. Yeah. And I here think. also at one, uh, we will explain a very uh, application for the RSTT protocol when we have to extend uh, the switch when we don't have enough ports is the first switch and then we will extend uh, for the second switch which is necessary via rstp protocol yes perfect so thanks again for all your questions we continue to answer them um, and we continue the webinar um, i think the next one i see here is um, would it be possible for a better learning effect to also receive the contrade files the fault records i think i assume that all of those questions come from the same person person i'm sorry and nina already mentioned yes you can get access to that we'll i think it's possible to send that yes. via mail or via sequence for download share this, yes. there are still some questions we keep those for the next question and answers round because we still have some time planned for you 
Now it's almost three hours that you are listening into um, us and thanks for still staying with us and stay tuned. Enjoy a short break, um, have a coffee or a tea, a sip of clean air and I think we'll meet again a bit after the full hour. So see you in a few minutes.
So welcome back again after the second short break. And I think it's time for part three right now of this BASPA tutorial number three. And soon Rainer will tell you about, um, or will tell his knowledge on CT dimensioning. And before that, I like to mention that if that was a bit too fast for you, what you've seen in the digital twin, in the configuration, and uh, with this product um, or project configuration in Dixie, you have two possibilities. Just watch the same stuff once again in the recording of the fast, or do a practical training in the Power Academy. So you can just book your training there and then go into an even more deeper dive with, um, with hands-on, with um, tutored hands-on and a training there. But enough um, advertisement for the Power Training Academy. I think, Rainer, let's go into the CT dimensioning. Let, please share your knowledge on that with us. <laughs> okay first part for the today's webinar gets to know more about CT dimensioning. CT dimensioning may be sometimes a little bit complicated uh, stuff. I want to give you now for today the basic knowledge. Let, oops, let's start. Okay, CT layout parameters. In general, we could really state that the CT requirements for the 7SS85, they have been the same CT requirements uh, for the old 7SS52 systems, and the CT requirements are very low. In the first step, they are quite low in comparison to the high in beans bus bar protection. So, in the 7SS85, we need no dedicated, no special CT types. Whereas for the high impedance bus bar protection, uh, really only the class PX according IEC 644-1 is required. For low impedance bus bar protection, uh, we stated and still stated, but uh, in the meantime, we are a little bit more how to say careful than in the past, uh, we can use different CT types, we can use different CT types, uh, but uh, new is we say don't avoid a mix of different CT types within one scheme. And special, especially is to avoid the mix of class B and the TBZ. Uh, class because there is a quite uh, different behavior uh, regarding uh, the TC component and so on. And this my for sensitive uh, application may cause problems. Whereas different CT ratios, and if you remember, this was one of the one of the questions. Uh, this is no problem at all. Uh, that's Low impedance bus bar protection, we are using a numerical uh, way, and the CT ratios uh, could be uh, matched without any problem. And as already said, in principle, there are as much difficult ratios uh, possible as you have different CTs. That means, in case of a large distributed bus bar protection with up to 48 CTs, uh, in the uh, theoretically, you can have a different uh, CT ratio for each of this uh, CT, whereas in reality, this would be uh, not the case, I guess, because so many different ratios are not available. Absolutely no problem is that the CT core uh, can be shared without any problem with different protective devices. You can use the same CT core for our bus bar protection, use the same CT core also for the overcurrent protection or anything else. Whereas in the high impedance beans bus bar protection, uh, really a separate core, core CT core explicitly for the high impedance beans bus bar protection application is required. But the CT requirements are also very low in comparison to the other protection devices. 
So the so KDD, I will later explain uh, how we come to the KDT. The KDT, the transient dimension factor, is for the 7SS85 0 0.5. It was the same for the 7SS52. Uh, for transformer differential protection, line differential protection, uh, we need a KDT of uh, 1.2 up to 5. And especially for distance protection, we need a very high KDT. Uh, what is for sure, uh, if somebody says, okay, the CD has been dimensioned uh, to fulfill the requirements for distance uh, protection, to fulfill the requirements for transformer protection, then no further calculation is necessary. You can immediately say, okay, it's fine for distance protection. Uh, no questions. We can use the score also for the bus bar protection device. This sometimes uh, astonish a little bit uh, the, uh, yeah, how do Asper protection, it's so important, it's so dangerous uh, to risk no wrong tripping. The CT requirements must be very high for such an important protection like the BASPA protection, but the difference is the case. Very important to state uh, that the 7SS85 is stable and this is proved also via a KEMA certificate for a remanent for up to 80%. The calculation I will do is uh, assuming that the remanent will be below 80% remanent. If the Remanence will be higher. We will introduce uh, soon in our manual an, uh, how to say a correct uh, a corrections uh, and to make the CD core the requirement a little bit higher, also to de deal with a remanence of more than eighty percent. But uh, for today, uh, I will assume a remanence of up to eighty percent only. Okay, this is also a quite often asked questions uh, and we have no numerical limit what is uh, uh, between the highest and the lowest, the maximum and the minimum CT ratio. But even the weakest CT must fulfill the requirements that is important. So that really all used different CTs must fulfill CT requirements. The CT requirements I will explain uh, in the next slides. Let's explain a little bit the necessary data to make uh, such uh, a CT dimensioning. Uh, that's uh, according IC 644. The system data, the ISSC max, sets the maximum short circuit current in the substation you want to protect. So typically uh, this maximum short circuit current will be uh, given by the, by the infeed, uh, by the, how, much, how much power can be supplied to the substation. The CT data, IPN, that's the rated primary current. If you remember, that was a thousand, one thousand amps for the feeder CTs and the two thousand amps for the uh, CTs and the coupler. We need SN, that is a rated CT power. We need RB, these are the rated resistive burden. Very important, that's a KSSC, that's a rated symmetrical short circuit current factor. And we need the secondary winding resistive, means the resistance of the secondary winding of the primary CT, and uh, with the abbreviation is RCT. And R dash P, that's the connected burden. And the connected burden, of course, uh, depends on the resistance of the leads, R leads, plus the resistance of the relay. Uh, this is more or less fixed. The uh, resistance of the relay of the 7SS85 is 0 0.1 ohm. Some notes. If you have CTs 
according to ANSI, IEEE, or the British standard, uh, this data should be converted to IEC, to IEC data. Uh, a lot of problems uh, I have quite often with the RCD, the secondary winding resistance of the primary CD. Uh, often I will be asked, okay, CD dimensioning, and I say, okay, it's fine, I can make for you a rough calculation whether it's fine or not. And uh, then often the secondary winding resistance of CD is not known. And uh, if you use the program CTTIM and you don't uh, enter the RCT, uh, they will work with a 20% of the rated power of the rated uh, power will be done. Uh, but this can lead really to an overdimensioning of the CT. So I really propose and give the recommendation really to measure, it's quite easy to measure the RCT, to measure uh, the secondary winding resistance of the primary CT. In case if you use a primary CT with a nominal, secondary nominal current of 5 amps, uh, attention should be paid to the resistance of the leads, because then here the resistance may be quite high. So resistance of the lead, of course, uh, is every time an issue really in a distributed bus bar protection uh, or in a wide area bus bar protection when a centralized bus bar protection may be uh, used. And uh, here's the resistance of the lead may be quite high, which could once again lead to an earlier saturation of the CDs. And that's the reason why in a wide area uh, substation uh, you should, or it's preferred to use really a distributed bus bar protection. We will see it, we will see it later in uh, the equations uh, for the CT dimensioning. Why is the KTT 0 0.5 for the 7SS85? First of all, it's very important to understand when really the stabilization factor uh, is important uh, when we have NCT uh, requiring and when we have a CT situation. If you remember uh, this slide uh, where we explained uh, the behavior of a of a CT saturation after around about uh, three milliseconds or anything more. You remember with the one out of one algorithm, uh, which will be blocked when at the very beginning uh, we have um, at the very beginning we are not we have a strong peak, uh, a strong increase of the stabilization current, but we are not in the tripping area, and it's the one out of one. Uh, algorithm will be blocked and then only the two out of two algorithm will be worked. Uh, and it's important to say that in this phase with a high DC offset, the K factor, whether the K factor is 0 0.5 or whether the K factor is uh, 0 0.8, which is the maximum, uh, has no importance. Has no importance. Proper dimension K factor is important in the static state here on the right side here of our simulated fault when really the TC uh, offset has been declined and uh, has gone back to zero. Because why is this TC offset? Okay, this TC offset may cause an earlier CT saturation, but on the other side, it will deliver us a very high stabilizing current. And via our mechanism of this modified stabilizing current, uh, we have so much uh, no problem really to overstand and not to wrongly trip at the beginning of a fault. Really, whether the CT dimensioning is not, not correct, you will see in the Static state means when the DC component has been declined. 
So the, the wrong tripping of an uh, external fault, why? Because the CD is not dimensioned correctly, will yeah, typically apply not in the first period. It will apply when the fault will not be cleared uh, fast enough uh, after roundabout, depending on the net constant after about 100, 150 milliseconds. It will apply here, exactly. And here, it's now in the simulation, we say set the saturation time, the time of saturation. And uh, to make a, a roughly calculation, we can say the limit of the stability is really given when the differential current uh, is the same like the stabilization factor multiplied with the modified stabilization current according to our tripping characteristic. Let's assume, because we need uh, an a uh, safety margin also, let's work with a stabilization factor of 0 0.5. So we get at the time of the saturation that sets the maximum differential current is the same, you will see here, like the short circuit current. Or in other words, the stabilization factor K multiplied with the maximum stabilization current. So that's uh, 0 0.5. That's our stabilization factor here in our case, and two times the, uh, the short circuit current. And so here really the differential current is the short circuit current. And if you look now here once again to the diagram, and this leads directly uh, to the state that the KTT is 0 0.5. And 0 0.5 means that it the CD must be able to transmit the half of the short circuit current. Because at the half, at omega multiplied with the saturation time, uh, 90 degrees uh, for a 50 hertz system, system, this means 5 milliseconds. At 5 milliseconds, we have transmitted the half of the short circuit current. And that's uh, the same uh, like the statement, uh, the KDT is 0 0.5. And that we don't need more belongs to our algorithm, belongs to our modified stabilization current. Let's a little bit think about this stabilizing factor K. As already said, only in the steady state, when the DC component has been declined, the K factor has really an influence to the stability. And that's directly lead to the statement uh, I have shown, uh, a wrong tripping in an external fault uh, due to wrong CT dimensioning will occur mostly in the steady state, means will uh, happen 100 milliseconds after fault injection with the saturation free time of omega multiplied with d sat more than 90 degrees, means the saturation free time is more than five milliseconds in a, a 50 hertz system. Oops, thanks. Uh, we can remain with the default setting of 0 0.65. As we learned, with a stabilization factor of 0 0.5, we are exactly at the limit. And we don't want to be with the stability at the limit with the bus bar protection. So we all every time have to calculate a little bit uh, a safety margin also. If the saturation free time is less than 90 degrees, means the saturation free time is less than 5 milliseconds for uh, 50 hertz systems, then we should uh, simulate this with the program, the CTTIM program, really to determine the required K factor. Here, really, a, a detailed calculation is quite complicated. Uh, to give you a, a rough uh, impression uh, how the K factor in dependency of the saturation free times looks like, uh, you have a look to this. Uh, characteristics on the right side. Here uh, we have the saturation free time for 50 hertz systems. And you will see uh, when the K factor will be 0 0.5 uh, 
every time when there is a higher uh, saturation free time than five milliseconds and the minimum saturation free time and uh, so that's around about two milliseconds then we should use a k factor of 0 0.8 uh, but whereas that's pure calculation without safety margin so in reality in reality i have said for saturation free time of five milliseconds we should use the stabilization factor of 0 0.65 and uh, even with the higher stabilization factor of 0 0.8 uh, should be used uh, in the maximum, you see it here at the stable, uh, for saturation free time of around about two, and, uh, two milliseconds and uh, 2.15 2 milliseconds around about. Okay. Let's a little bit calculate. And let's uh, talk a little bit about abbreviations. It's every time not so easy and in different literature and in different manuals, uh, there are different uh, abbreviations uh, used for the more or less same terms. The required symmetrical short circuit factor uh, sets the KDT, the KDT 0 0.5 for the 7SS85 multiplied with the maximum short circuit current of the substation divided by the primary rated current. So all these considerations must be done for each CT, for each different CT type with uh, maybe different ratios. If they are used every time uh, the same uh, CT with the same CT ratio, of course, uh, you can do this uh, calculation only once. We need the effective uh, symmetrical short circuit factor or in our manual now also used as the operational ALF. Uh, that's a uh, ALF, oh, I do not know, that's a limiting factor, the accuracy limiting factor uh, it's called. And this, but I will name it more the effective uh, symmetrical short circuit factor. That's the rated symmetrical short circuit factor multiplied with the rated burden plus the primary resistance of the CT divided with the uh, connected burden plus the primary resistance of the CT. And the CT is fine if the effective symmetrical short circuit factor is higher than the required. And in addition, due to the limit of the measuring range, you have to see whether the maximum short circuit factor divided by the primary rated current is smaller than 100. Okay. A small example, we have a bus bar protection, we have a transformer uh, with a primary current of 600 and uh, secondary rated current is 1M. We have a 5P10 uh, CT type with an rated power of 15VA. The resistance of the secondary winding is 4 ohms. We have leads, they are 50 meters, and we have copper, uh, the leads are copper with a cross-sectional area of 4 square millimeters. And as already said, the burden of the relay, the burden of the 7SS85 is 0 0.1 ohm. The maximum short circuit current is 30 kiloamps. We start with the required symmetrical short circuit factor, set the KTT of the device, multiplied with the maximum short circuit current, divided by the primary rated current, set 0 0.5, multiplied with 30 kiloamps, divided to with 600 amps, so the required symmetrical short circuit factor is 25. 
let's come to the operational uh, symmetrical salt circuit factor. Here we need some additional calculations. The resistance of the leads, that's two times the specific uh, resistance multiplied with length divided with the cross sectional area, that's two times 0 0.0179 multiplied with the 50 meters divided by the four uh, square millimeters and you will see also with the dimension everything is fine so the outcome is 0 0.45 ohms the rated burden that's the rated power uh, of the CT divided with the secondary rated current uh, squared so that's the 15 VA divided with 1 M squared. So the so RP is 15 ohms. So the effective symmetrical salt circuit factor or the operational ALF is the rated symmetrical salt circuit factor multiplied with the rated burden plus the resistance of the CD divided to the connected burden with the plus the resistance of the T. So that's 10. So that's this rated. This after this 5P10. That's a uh, rated symmetrical short circuit factor. And 15 plus 4 divided with 0 0.55. The 0 0.5 are the 0 0.45 plus the 0 0.1 of the relay of the burden. So that's this 0 0.55 plus 4. So the effective symmetrical short circuit factor is 42. And so the effective symmetrical short circuit factor is higher than the required. So it's fine. And uh, we have to check also the, uh, the limit of the operational. So that's the 30 ke divided with 600 that's 50 and that's smaller than 100 and so in this case everything is fine the CD is corrected correctly dimensioned if not if according to this calculation it comes to a problem as already mentioned uh, we should start and dimensioning with uh, the program CT Tim and uh, to find out whether it will be still possible to fix this, uh, that the CT is not, will not fulfill this equation uh, to fix it with a higher K factor. And that's so here's this CT dimensioning with the program CT TIM, which is maintained by our, by our colleagues from the PTI. So I am finished. <laughs> I'd say almost finished. We <laughs> still have some questions and we will take some time to answer them. And let's see, find some space for me right here. And you will see those questions enlarged a bit. And I will scroll down to kind of, we, we continue the journey with the older questions and try to answer as many as possible in the next minutes. Um, I think we have a little bit less than 50 minutes. There you go. Um, CT had the question, so I think we can skip the one from VB. We already had some answers to those. And CT wants to know, what are the differences comparing with other simulation tools, such as Omicron, for instance? Okay. Um, <laughs> I think that refers to the digital twin. Yes, I guess. Um, so the digital twin is the simulation of our protection device, uh, our Supertech protection device. And um, Omicron is, of course, a test, uh, testing tool for protection device. So there's, of course, a difference. And Omicron does not offer a digital twin version yet. So, so if Omicron offered a digital twin, we could connect our C-Protect digital twin <laughs> and really simulate values in there, but we don't need to because we have it all in one box, right? Uh, yes, yeah. you could say it like this. Yes. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So thanks for the question. 
And then CT wants to know, in case of a centralized protection, how do you ensure the backup? What kind of backup? I, I am not sure. Backup of the project? Backup protection? I, I'd understand I it, guess it the may... question of the protection function. So yeah. if I talk about just one device doing all the central mm. protection functions, mm. what's happening if this device fails? Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, you can <laughs> already add some backup uh, protection function to each bay, means to each uh, to each feeder to the coupler. We have already added uh, circuit breaker failure protection as a backup. You can also add uh, overcurrent protection to each feeder bay. You can add up to 10 directional overcurrent protection, even in the centralized bus protection uh, sets. And you can also add backup protection, maybe some kind of frequency protection or over voltage under, uh, yeah, over voltage under voltage protection sets all possible. Okay. But in general, you will have any way in a substation, not only passport protection, you will have any way. So every protection is not allowed to have no backup. Yeah. So that's the backup functionality we have available directly in our centralized passport protection. But I think in any case, you will have any way an independent line protection device in any case. Okay. Thank you. So let's take the question from VB. So um, assume a fault in the dead zone of the bus coupler. If VB got it correctly or got it correctly, the BBP will trip both bus zones in case of a three pole fault and only bu one bus zone in case of a one pole fault. Um, is this correct? Or is this understood <laughs> correctly? Uh, yes, I, I think I know what is meant. Perfect. Um, so in case we, we have these setting values that we take a look at, took a look at earlier. So there are, there are these two thresholds for a three pole and a one pole fault. And as soon as we are above this threshold, um, it, the device will trip in overlapping mode. This means it will trip both bus zones. In the settings we chose, uh, we had it for three pole faults um, to one amp and for the single pole faults to um, five amp. So as soon as we are above this one amp and we have a three pole fault, yes, we will trip both bus zones um, immediately. And um, if we only have a one pole fault, then the tripping will be sequential. That means in the first step, the um, coupler CT will open and then the end fault protection gets active and only the selective zone that is uh, feeding the fault will be tripped. Um, and we, yeah, for, for this, for a more complete or comprehensive answer, I would once again recommend our <laughs> second tutorial. Yes, around maybe, end fault protection, may, right? Maybe one additional hint, why we selected uh, exactly to trip the three pole faults uh, in an overlapping mode and the one pole faults uh, non over in the sequential way. The reason behind, of course, is that the sequential tripping took quite a long time uh, really to finally uh, clear the fault. And when we implemented this function, I did this together with. Um, a customer in Tasmanian, it was Transnet, and uh, they requested more or less this functionality from our device, and they did some very interesting investigation in their in their network, and they came out. Uh, it's a little bit simplified. In reality, it depends also on which kind of power you have. If you have more wind power, it's more sensitive. If you have more inertial conventional power. Uh, it's not so, but uh, at the end it came out for high current three bolt faults. Uh, it's maybe quite critical to wait long uh, because an eye, eye landing of the network could happen. So it's maybe a good idea. Uh, high current three bolt faults uh, really, it's better to clear it very fast, but not selective. 
whereas for single pole faults, uh, this eye landing is not so sensitive uh, and uh, you may have more time really and the sel selectivity is more important and can be accepted uh, for one pole faults. And that's the reason why uh, we make this example uh, to, to yeah, make the three ball fault uh, clearing in overlapping and the one ball fault uh, in this sequential way. But if you are interested, I have already said uh, <laughs> there exists a very good paper. Uh, which I have written together with the guys from Transnet. And if you are interested and you will send me an email or anything else, I will forward this paper to you. Thanks. Yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, but, uh, knowledge from the customer and from yeah. the customer's <laughs> network is um, worth a lot. That's true. And next question came in from RPS. And RPS wants to know which settings are to be preferred to avoid the propagation of one bay fault to another one. Did we see this setting? I don't in the understand what this means. Do you understand it? Like cascading eventually? But okay, Shade too complicated. To avoid propagation of one bay fault to another one. No, sorry. No okay, so we, we'll take that <laughs> offline and um, eventually it, it gets clearer mm. if we find more there. And if not, uh, this can also be done on a 101 discussion. And taking care a bit of the time, um, let's jump to the next one. I think we've talked about CT polarity and um, to be changed by the star point for all the bays. Um, but um, let's jump to the next one from HNS. Um, where the oh, impacts on this, does this continue? There we go. Whether the measurement ID number in function group connections is too sequential and it can be modified. Any impacts on this? This is also a fragmented question. Measurement ID. You know maybe something measurement? again for the maybe BDK. an internal number for of our measuring point. Mm. I'm not clear with these questions. I... Okay, let's see um, if we can handle one last question from RPS. What difficulties will be faced when using two different make relays? I think it might be relays from different vendors. For example, in one bus yeah. section okay. and another in the incoming or outgoing bay. So what difficulties can be faced if we talk about relays from different vendors? I think. Yeah. Or different make relay, different types of. Oh, maybe we, we are already tired. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. And it's, 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 it's tricky to to get the the meaning mm. of the question. So am, let's see if we not, can. I am also not sure. Not sure if this is, is fine. Relays to yeah. Make the yeah. Outputs. Maybe maybe if you get the questions in the next days and mm. you will do them. That or that brings me to how we continue, or, or, right? I am even not sure mm. whether it's really. <laughs> Uh, different relays from different vendors or different types of binary outputs? I'm Maybe not... something like this. So we'll take this question to you in a written format. You will get a written answer. And we, since we are already um, almost running out of time, it's fine that we uh, quit answering right now mm. the questions here. Nevertheless, all the questions that are still in the questions field will be answered written. Um, and you will receive a mail with that. And you will receive a mail with access to the recording. I think you already found out that we um, have the recordings of the former two tutorials around bus bar protection. And we refer to them quite a few times today. So if you haven't been part of those, take the chance and watch the recordings of the tutorials two and one. Um, I hope that you will make extensive um, usage of your knowledge around the application of the centralized CProtec 7 SS85 you've learned today and around the CT dimensioning. 
If you want to train what you've learned here, I already mentioned our Power Academy, and I think the link to the Power Academy will also be part of the pack of one of the packages you will receive from us. And to continue this journey and this webinar series, um, it's just um, now, well, I hope that I will see you again, or <laughs> we hope that we will see you again around the 4th of April for our last tutorial in the session of Baspa tutorials. And there we will do a deeper dive on the application of a distributed CProtec 5 Baspa protection and on maintenance functions. So for today, I hope that you and your grids will stay safe and protected. And we here from the studio say goodbye for today and see you in the next tutorial. Take care. Goodbye. Bye.